afternoon, everyone. Thank you for turning, tuning into IDL's Pant Endowment Land Strategy Focus Group. Uh, appreciate everyone's time today. It's one o'clock, and I'd like to be a prompt here at the department, so we can begin today's, uh, today's meeting. My name is Scott Phillips. I'm the Policy and Communications Chief for the Idaho Department of Lands. On behalf of the department and the land board, I want to thank all of our panelists for being willing to provide their time and tune in and help out and uh, provide their feedback. It's very important for the department to hear that, and I know it's a wish of the land board as well. Um, additionally, for those who are uh, tuning in as attendees, I want to thank you for your attention this afternoon. So in addition to our panelists, we have the attendees. The difference between those uh, capabilities within this call are such. The panelists will have unfettered access to ask questions and, and speak and uh, interact with the presenters during the presentation. The attendees will, are in a watch mode where they can watch and listen. Uh, we are recording this presentation, so it could be available later on if you need it for some reason. I uh, just want to make sure that you're aware of that so there are no surprises. Additional housekeeping uh, items. Um, if uh, you are a panelist, if you please mute your phone. I think we've talked about that a little bit before. Uh, for the panelists, there'll be question and answer opportunities built into the session today. We have two throughout today. Additionally, if you have questions during any presentations, you're welcome to put those in through the Zoom chat function. I'll be monitoring those and I can interrupt and ask those questions. Um, I guess bearing that, uh, we're scheduled until four o'clock this afternoon. We will have a break in the middle of it. The break will be about 15 minutes. And so with that, I would like to ask IDL staff to please introduce themselves. And we're gonna go on the order that you are listed on the agenda for today's meeting. So uh, Director Miller, that puts you in the hot seat. <laughs> All right, <clears throat> good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dustin Miller. I'm the director for the Idaho De Department of Land. So uh, thank you all for participating today. Angela? Good afternoon. My name is Angela Kaufman. I'm a Deputy Attorney General, and I'm one of the Deputy Attorney Generals representing the Idaho Department of Lands. Bill. Hi, everybody. I'm Bill Hoganson. I'm the Deputy Director for IDL, and I'm located here in Boise. All right. Jim, are you there? Yes, sir. My name is Jim Elvin. I'm the division administrator over trust lands for the Department of Lands, and I work out of the Coeur d'Alene staff office. Ryan. Ryan Montoya, Real Estate Services Bureau Chief. I am in the Boise office. Sid. Sid, uh, Real Estate Program Manager out of the staff office in Boise. Scott. Um, Scott Corkle, I'm the area manager for the Payette Lake Supervisor area in McCall. Scott, I comment your background doesn't look like the beautiful shores of Payette Lake this time of year. Uh, I'm dreaming. All right. Tammy. Hi, I'm Tammy Armstrong, and I am a land program specialist here in the Boise office. Before I move on to introducing the attendees, I just want to comment that I'm very proud to be working with this team here at IDL. We've put a lot of work into this and a lot of dedicated professionals and Thank you for everything you did to uh, make today's meeting possible. So on the focus group members, Annette. All right, Michelle, are you here? I am here, yeah. I'm Michelle Brunevelt. I'm the Community and Economic Development Director at the City of McCall. Michelle, I noticed with the link that you logged in using the structure list is Tammy Armstrong. So if anyone else is logged in and it says Tammy on your name, uh, near the upper right-hand corner of your cell where your picture is, there are three dots. If you click on those dots, you can click on the rename function and choose a name, uh, any name you want, preferably your own. Brad Compton, are you online with us today? There you are. Good afternoon. Yes, Brad Compton. I'm uh, representing the Idaho Sportsman. We're a new nonprofit sporting organization. Um, in the state. Brian Scott. Uh, Brian Scott, live in Boise, Idaho. Uh, we represent Shore Lodge Whitetail and McCall as well. Clive. Mute. 
Clive Strong, uh, unaffiliated. <laughs> Clive, it's wonderful to see you again. It's been too long. Yes. Good to see you, Scott. Craig Utter. Good afternoon. I'm Craig Utter. I'm the executive director of the Payette Land Trust up here in McCall. Dave Bingaman. Uh, yeah, good afternoon, and uh, thanks for the invite to join. Uh, I'm one of the Valley County Commissioners, and I also am, uh, was asked to represent uh, the Central Mountain Bike, Central Idaho Mountain Bike Association as well for this group. Um, you know, obviously, Valley County has a lot of different interests in the uh, future of the IDL lands around the area, and um, Simba actually happens to be one of the leaseholders. We currently hold a recreational lease on the um, west side of Payette Lake, so I'm wearing a couple of different hats today. Thank you. Uh, David Simmons. Good afternoon. I'm Dave Simmons. I'm the president of the Big Pay Lake Water Quality Council. And I uh, just wanted to say to uh, Scott, I've got the real picture of Pay at Lake covered on this one. It looks good. Much nicer than the view from here in Boise. To guarantee that one. Uh, Diane, are you with us today? I am. I'm Diane Plastino Graves. My husband and I have owned property on the west side of Pay at Lake for almost 40 years. I've been involved in Department of Lands and Landlord Issues since about 1992, first with a group called um, the Payette Lakes Cottage Site Owners Association. Then um, I was delighted to be one of the original members of the Big Payette Lake Water Quality Council and served for 26 years there with Peter Johnson. Um, I've also been affiliated with the Payette Lakes um, Cabin Owners Association. Some of these organizations have very similar names, as well as a group called Citizens for Pay at Lake, which dealt with some endowment land issues on the west side. And I think I'm generally representing homeowners on Pay at Lake, as well as myself in having um, a variety of um, experiences with the Department of Lands and the Land Board. Thanks, Diane. Uh, Jonathan. Thanks, uh, thanks, Scott, and uh, thanks to IDL for the invite to participate in this focus group. My name is Jonathan Oppenheimer, and I serve as the external relations director with the Idaho Conservation League. Uh, and I ICL was founded back in 1973 to serve as a voice for conservation in the state house. And uh, we work to protect the air you breathe, the water you drink, and the lands you love. So look forward to this discussion and, and being amongst all my uh, distinguished uh, focus group mates. Uh, and since we're doing a, a competition on background, I decided to throw up this one. That's one of our stock backgrounds, but I might rotate those through uh, the course of the meeting and the focus group to keep you guys interested. Julie Manning. Good afternoon. I'm Julie Manning, and I'm here today representing the Payette Endowment Lands Alliance. Thanks, Julie. Kristen and Claire. Hi, everybody. Thank you for uh, the invite as well. I am Kristen Sinclair. I live in McCall. And uh, I'm, I'm today representing the HOA that I live in, which is Brightwater off of the East Side Drive. I'm also, uh, my husband and I are also um, investors, part of the investor group for Brundage. And I um, have a vested interest in McCall because my Great great grandfather settled here in 1910. So I um, go way back. Thank you. Deep family roots. Matt. Uh, afternoon, everybody. Matt Lindy, uh, Ponderosa State Park uh, Park Manager. Robert Looper. So I have the uh, real background as it exists today. For those of you who don't know, we're in the middle of a blizzard. Uh, which is super, <clears throat> but my name is uh, Bob Looper. I'm president of, of Brundage Mountain, and I also am president of the Pilgrim Cove Homeowner Association, which is an association of 88 homeowners that are on Payette Lake and abutting the uh, endowment lands. Thanks, Bob. Uh, Susan Buxton. So I pronounced Susan online yet. Tara King. Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to learn more about this. Uh, I am Tara King. I work for Idaho Forest Group as a resource and business analyst and my background is in forestry and I, I also hold a real estate license here in Idaho and Washington. All right, and then concluding the panel, uh, Nick Harris. 
think he's got a thing for the invitation to participate and thank you to the Idaho Department of Lands for the opportunity to put in my thoughts. Um, and I apologize, my camera is uh, not working, so you probably can't see, see me, but hopefully you can hear me. Um, but uh, I am a financial services executive. I have over 20 plus years in the investment banking world. So finance is sort of my background. And uh, my family, like me, others here has been in the McCall area for multiple generations and long-term property owners. And um, you know, look forward to working with everybody. Well, thank you, Nick. We, we, of course, couldn't see you, but you were a little garbled, but I think it was pretty clear what you were saying. I think everyone was able to get the gist of it. Um, so next on deck with the agenda, I'm going to turn over to my boss, Dustin Miller, and have him kind of explain the charge and the purpose of today's focus group. All right. Thanks, Scott. And I don't know if there's anybody we missed uh, that we're seeing right now that didn't introduce themselves real quick. Or I think maybe we um. Hi, everybody. I'm Annette Spickard. I'm the city manager for McCaw. I apologize for being a couple minutes late and look forward to hearing the presentation. Thank you. Great. Chris, Chris we can't hear you for some reason. Uh, it's, it says you're unmuted. Uh, Chris, so Chris, Chris Anton is our, uh, he works for the Endowment Fund Investment Board. Um, as most of you know, um, <clears throat> that's the other part of how uh, this, uh, the state generates revenue for our beneficiaries is really two part through our investments and uh, the income coming off of our endowment property. So um, Chris is the lead investment manager for the Endowment Fund Investment Board. So um, <clears throat> hopefully that was a sufficient introduction, Chris. <laughs> Dustin, if I interject, uh, Annette has joined us. Annette, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, sure. Annette Spickard, I'm the city manager for McCall. Thanks, Dustin. Brian, Benjamin, did you get a chance? Uh, I'll do it just real quick. Brian Benjamin, I'm uh, land board staff for land board member, uh, the controller, Brandon Wolf. I'm kind of here just to observe and uh, um, I may not be here the entire time. All right. I'm here too, Dustin. This is Carly. Hi, everyone. I'm the same as Brian. I am land board staff for Superintendent of Public Instruction, Sherry Ibarra. So won't be here the whole time, but I am excited to listen in. Great. And since we're on the uh, topic, I'll introduce myself. Um, if you can hear me, this is Daryl Early. Uh, I am the Division Chief of the Natural Resources Division and um, uh, also Land Board staff uh, and counsel to the Land Board. All right. I think we've got everybody and <clears throat> there may be others that, that joined that um, we asked to participate in the group. Uh, one absent for right now is uh, the Payette National Forest. Uh, we'd reached out to gauge their interest in participating. We know there is interest, but I don't know if they were able to uh, get somebody to uh, join this meeting today. So um, we will uh, stand by for them to join. <clears throat> Well, welcome everybody. And again, I'm Dustin Miller. I'm the director for the Idaho Department of Lands and really appreciate everybody taking the time to be a part of this process. Um, as Scott indicated, um, this has been uh, kind of a big undertaking over the last several months. And uh, I can't say enough about the staff here at IDL in the Trust Lands Division and the Real Estate Bureau for pulling the, the draft plan together, started with the concept, draft plan and then uh, getting this focus group set up. So um, really kudos to our team uh, here in Trust Lands and Real Estate for, for getting this done. Um, you know, I think many of you are all familiar with uh, endowment lands um, and we'll get into a lot of history on the endowment lands. Uh, but in short, uh, these lands were granted to the states uh, before or at the, uh, the time of uh, the state entering the union. <clears throat> um, these lands were pulled out of the public domain and given to the state to, to be managed in a way to produce income for public schools and other beneficiaries. 
Um, in fact, going along with that is the constitutional mandate that the land board and the Department of Lands as their administrative arm operate under, um, which is a mandate to uh, secure the maximum long-term financial return to our endowment beneficiaries. And again, the largest beneficiary being uh, Idaho's schools. <clears throat> and I will say that, um, you know, our staff out there on the ground do a phenomenal job. In fact, our, our motto is uh, working lands and trusted stewards. And it's our, uh, our professional land managers who take seriously their job to professionally and sustainably manage these endowment lands to meet uh, the constitutional mandate that I just described. <clears throat> and so I'm really proud of the work that, uh, that our for folks do. And in this particular area, you have uh, uh, Scott Corkle at the helm of our, our Pay at Lakes field office. And uh, um, he gets to, we, we joke that Scott gets all the, all the easy issues in the Pay at Lake area. Is that right, Scott? <laughs> Um, and, uh, you know, certainly there's a, there's, there's an ongoing educational campaign as to what endowment lands are and what they're not. Um, you know, and that's, that's a, a, a continuous thing. In fact, I'd like to tell folks that when I started about two and a half years ago, I pulled into a service station there in McCall in an IDL vehicle, IDL truck that had the Idaho Department of Land sticker on the door. <clears throat> and a gentleman came up to me and said, Idaho Department of Lands, huh? My dad used to work for the Forest Service too. So right then and there, you know, it just dawned on me that uh, these have been issues that uh, the, the confusion over endowment lands versus public lands, federal public lands, is, has been an ongoing thing for uh, quite some time. And again, it's, a, it's sort of a continuous educational campaign. Um, <clears throat> you know, these lands are certainly not uh, managed the same way as, as federal public lands are. We operate under different uh, uh, mandates, different statutes, different rules, uh, again, focused on uh, that primary mandate to maximize revenue uh, sustainably for our endowment beneficiaries. Um, <clears throat> as everybody on this call knows, the land board uh, directed the department to develop a, a strategy for both uh, long-term and short-term uh, recommendations to increase revenue and address some of the uh, challenges we've been seeing with endowment lands uh, within the McCall area and predominantly uh, the McCall area of impact. <clears throat> um, we've got uh, a, a number of piece of pieces of ground within that 5,500 acres where um, one, one could argue that we're not meeting our mandate on being that uh, the gap is widening between the value of the land and the income coming off uh, of that land. And so um, certainly this generated a lot of discussion over time uh, on, on what we need to be doing differently there. Um, you all have seen the draft plan that's been out uh, since December uh, that the land board uh, uh, directed us to do. They, we, we presented on that uh, in November. <clears throat> and now is the time to really uh, roll up our sleeves to dig into it and make sure that uh, uh, we're getting it right. Um, we've asked uh, you all as, as community leaders and, and, and leaders in industry and conservation to uh, um, provide us some feedback, to weigh in, to be a part of this focus group. Um, and uh, again, give us those comments, uh, those thoughts, uh, the feedback on this plan, because again, we want to make sure that uh, we're getting it right. And there may be some things that we're, we're, we're not focusing on right now that we could stand to take a look at. Um, this isn't a, a, a process that we normally uh, do. We don't have the same uh, uh, public processes, again, as the Forest Service or BLM does. But transparency is important to both the land board and the Department of Lands and me as the director. And so having this focus group assembled uh, is, is, is a necessary thing, I believe, uh, to ensure that we are having conversations, uh, that we are getting the feedback, <clears throat> but at the same time, we're preserving the, the decision space for the land board. Uh, the land board will, will have the final say uh, on this plan and then uh, the leasing activities that occur um, uh, once the plan is completed. So again, different processes, but again, uh, your role is, uh, is really just to uh, uh, dig into the plan uh, over the next several weeks, uh, provide us with some, with some feedback and uh, some comments and uh, uh, you know, your thoughts. So with that, um, that's all I have, Scott. And uh, I, again, I thank everybody for being a part of this. I look forward to the dialogue with you all moving forward. So Scott, back to you. Thank you, Dustin. Next on the agenda, Angela Kaufman will lead us through the uh, responsibilities and authorities of the land board and some really interesting historical facts. I think you're going to 
find enlightening. So Angelo, uh, the floor is yours. All right, uh, let me just share my screen here with you. Actually, let me, there we go. Oops. Okay. So um, just to reintroduce myself, my name is Angela Kaufman. I'm a, the lead deputy attorney general for the Idaho Department of Lands. Um, I've been with the attorney general's office for a number of years and I've been representing the Department of Lands for almost five years now. Um, Scott and Dustin and the IDL folks asked me to come talk to you a little bit about um, the legal principles behind Idaho's endowment lands and the requirements that the land board and IDL must follow in managing those lands. And, um, you know, Scott was talking about interesting historical facts. I'm not sure that I'm going to give you lots of interesting historical facts, but I'll sure give you a historical background and the legal framework to how we got where we are today. Um, with the with the endowment lands. So um, as to the screen, actually, since you were all talking about backgrounds, this is Payette Lake. Um, kudos to and credit to Robbie Johnson with um, Scott's communications team. She was kind enough to provide this lovely photo to me. And so thanks to her for that. So Dustin, um, in his introduction, talked a little bit about the differences and the misunderstandings about public lands versus endowment lands. And I'm not gonna talk about um, different types of state-owned lands in Idaho so much. I think the most helpful contrast between public lands and endowment lands is to talk about those forest service and uh, BLM lands. So when you hear the term public lands, uh, you know, you're often talking about uh, federally owned lands. And um, most of you probably know, because it sounds like most of you have deep roots in this lovely state, uh, approximately 63% of Idaho is comprised of federal lands. So Idaho, perhaps more than most, um, really has deep ties with those federally owned public lands. Uh, the Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management are uh, multi-purpose agencies in terms of the, the lands that they manage. So, for example, the Forest Service has a mission to sustain the health, diversity, and productivity of the nation's forests and grasslands to meet the needs of present and future generations. And they also say that we balance the short and long-term needs of people and nature. And they're governed by federal laws such as the Organic Act and the Multiple Use Sustained Yield Act, among others. Similarly, Bureau of Land Management has a multifaceted um, mission regarding the, its lands. And their mission is to sustain the health, diversity, and productivity of public lands for the use and enjoyment of present and future generations. And they have a multiple use and sustained yield mission. Um, and their primary authority comes from the Federal Land Policy and Management Act. I would also say at this point that there are a myriad of other federal laws that apply to the Forest Service and to BLM. Um, you know, one that many of you who are involved in public lands issues may be most familiar with would be um, NEPA, which is the statute that provides for review and consultation and input um, regarding these federal public lands. Um, so endowment lands in Idaho are, are different. We're not governed by those federal laws. Um, there is no NEPA process. Um, but before diving into that part, I just to kind of build on what Director Miller said about endowment lands, they were lands granted by the federal government at or near statehood. There was a, a certain set of federal lands that had been granted while Idaho was still a territory. 
The primary grants are found in the Idaho Admission Bill. And um, of course, that's the, the document that led us to be the, the state that we are today. It sets forth several specific um, grants. They're worded slightly differently in the Idaho Admission Bill. So the way I'm describing them um, below on this slide is the way that we refer to them now for sake of management of the endowments and the endowment funds. So there's the public school endowment, which is the one that um, many of you are probably most familiar with. And that's the one that historically just, uh, here, here's the historical fact, um, at statehood, Idaho was granted sections 13 and 36 of every township um, as the public school endowment lands. And if those sections weren't available for whatever reason, then um, Idaho was allowed to select in lieu lands to ensure that it got the full complement um, a, a number of acres. Uh, there is an agricultural college endowment and that's the University of Idaho. That's the agricultural college in the state. Charitable institutions, which includes Idaho State University, uh, State Juvenile Corrections, the School for the Deaf and Blind, the Idaho Veterans Home and State Hospital North. And I think that should actually be State Hospital South. Um, the normal school fund, normal schools are uh, really teachers colleges. Um, now that's the Idaho State University Department of Education and Lewis and Clark State, Lewis Clark State College. I will say um, a personal historical fact, my grandmother would have been the beneficiary of this fund. Um, in the 1920s, she attended um, a teacher's college at, in Gooding, in, what's, in the building that's been many things over time. Uh, but that was a, it was a teacher's college at the time. And so she attended there. Uh, there's a penitentiary endowment on the penitentiary. I will tell you there's also some penitentiary reserve lands that are not endowment lands and they're not managed as endowment lands. Those lands are really where the old penitentiary is. Um, the old pen had been established by the time Idaho was a state. And so one of the grants of land from the federal government was for that land specifically. Um, School of Science, University of Idaho, State Hospital South, so there, there that is, um, the University Endowment, which is the University of Idaho, and then there's a, a Capital Permit Endowment, and that all, um, when there's any money generated for that endowment, it goes directly into a permanent fund. So starting with the Idaho Admission Bill, I mean, here is really the heart of where the land board and IDL's mission and uh, responsibility starts. Um, and so section 12 of that bill provides that the lands granted by this section shall be held, appropriated, and disposed of exclusively for the purpose herein mentioned. And that's the import that's important language in such man manner as the legislature of the state may provide. That last part, while not underlined, is also important. So as we'll kind of see a little bit um, in the rest of my talk today and probably throughout uh, this group's discussions, the legislature may certainly pass statutes regarding endowment lands and they have done so. However, the criti critical thing to keep in mind there is those statutes still have to be consistent with the constitutional principles that I'm about to talk to talk to you about. So Idaho Constitution Article 9 talks about um, state lands and Section 7 is really sort of the first um, important section for our purposes today provides that the State Board of Land Commissioners shall have the direction, control and disposition of the public lands of the state under such regulations as may be prescribed by law. So again, you see what we just saw in the Idaho admission bill, right? Where the land board has the direction and control, the legislature can pass um, statutes. The heart of the matter though, the, the language that's, that's just so important and that really when it comes to endowment lands guides the mission of the land board and IDL on a daily basis, it's article nine, Section 8 of the Idaho Constitution and sets forth the land board is, board's duties and obligations to the various endowment beneficiaries. 
Now what's on this screen is only a portion of article nine, section eight. I will tell you there are other, there's other language in it that's that's equally important um, that set has requirements for um, the number of acres that can be sold to any one person and the maximum number of acres that can be sold on an annual basis. Those are, are important things too, but I think for purposes of the discussion today, what I have up here on the screen is really, really the heart of it. So um, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna read all of this even, but the important things to know. So the land board has the duty to provide for the location protection, sale and rental of all lands uh, granted to or acquired by the state buyer from the general to by the state buyer from the general government again under such regulations as may be prescribed by law and in such manner as will secure the maximum long term financial return to the institution to which grant to which granted and that's one of the first important obligations that I'm going to chat with you about um, in just a little bit and director Miller talked about that too. Um, provided that no state land shall be sold for less than the appraised price. That's something that I think may factor into the discussions going forward. Um, so the legislature then has the authority to provide that the general grants of lands to the state shall be judiciously located and carefully preserved. Um, and part of that is for many of the um, the endowments, there were not necessarily specific acres that were designated um, like there were for public schools. Carefully preserved and held in trust um, for the use and benefit of the respective object for which said lands of grant, said grants of land were made. For me, um, in guiding what I, what advice I give to IDL, it's that held in trust language that I find to be um, so very important. Um, the land board and IDL are trustees for these endowments. And if any of you have ever been the beneficiary of a trust or have set up a trust or have been a trustee, you know how um, really sacred those duties are and how important your obligations as a fiduciary are. So the, the trust responsibility is the second um, principle. The third one is the disposal at public auction. That's also important. Um, it guides what the land, land board can do with these important endowment lands. And as we'll see in a little bit, disposal means not just uh, the sale of land, but it also means um, leases. So that's why IDL has a, a process. So again, the three prim primary obligations is the trust obligation, which is the duty to act solely in the beneficiary's interest, the duty to maximize long-term financial returns to the endowment beneficiaries, and then the public auction requirement. And I just wanna share um, in these next few slides, some, some things that Idaho, the Idaho Supreme Court has had to say over the course of a hundred years regarding those obligations. Um, it, you know, the court's been very consistent in many of these things, and it's just so helpful to hear them. So one of the more recent things about the land board and IDL as trustee was uh, from what actually seems like a very short time ago, but looking at the date, it was nine years ago in Wasden versus State Board of Land Commissioners. And I know um, some of you were involved in one way or the other on this litigation, but um, you know, one of the, the things that the court said is that the state's endowment lands are part of a sacred trust reserved for the benefit of Idaho's public schools and public institutions. The board which manages those endowment lands is the epitomic, I've actually added an extra syllable in there traditionally, um, epitomic public trustee. You know, again, that's, that's the heart of this, uh, heart of the endowment mission. Um, a few years prior to that, uh, the Supreme Court, in considering a case that had to do with um, grazing leases, said that Article 9, Section 8, which is the, um, the section I was just talking about, 
requires that the state consider only the maximum long-term financial return to the schools in the leasing of school endowment lands by attempting to promote funding for the schools and the state through the leasing of public school lands, Idaho Code Section 58.310B, which was the code section they were considering in that litigation, violates the requirements of Article 9, Section 8. And then, uh, you know, 100 years ago, um, you know, some, you know, the, the issues were every bit as um, present and important as they are now. The Supreme Court said the Constitution vests the control, management, and disposition of state lands in the State Board of Land Commissioners. They are, as it were, the trustees or business managers for the state in handling these lands. And on matters of policy, expediency, and the business interest of the state, they are the sole and exclusive judges so long as they do not run counter to the provisions of the Constitution or statute. So a few minutes ago when I was talking about um, the authority of the legislature to pass statutes regarding endowment lands, I, you know, and I, I talked about that a little bit. So I wanted to add this caveat to the previous slide. So Again, the, the legislature can pass statutes and that govern and direct IDL and the land board regarding endowment lands. However, those statutes must still be um, consistent with the constitution. So here's, here's kind of what the, the, the court has said um, about this. There's a, a case from 1921. So Actually, this is 100 years ago. The Pike case was 110. Um, you know, I, I keep telling people I went to law school so I could pay an expert to do math for me, but you'd think I could uh, see the difference between 100 and 110. Um, so they were talking about disposition of public lands and just said direction, the land board has direction, control, and disposition, but it must be in accordance with the constitution and statutes of the state and not otherwise. Um, so, and then in the Balderston case, the court said, if the land board's action involves the exercise of a judgment or discretion vested in them by law, the court will not control, direct, or interfere with that action. However, if it is without authority of law or has no legal sanction or authority, this court may interrupt them and declare the law on the subject and point out to them the legal scope of their discretion. And then the Pike case, which we just described. So the second really important duty, and I, I say it second, not because it's any less important, but just because I think it meshes so well with the trustee obligation. So in the Idaho watersheds case that I talked about a little bit ago, um, the court noted that Article 9, Section 8 requires that the state consider only the maximum long-term financial return to the schools in the leasing of school endowment public grazing lands. And while that case involved um, public school lands, it, that it, the holding applies to all endowments. Um, so it, you know, it, it's just equally applicable there. In the Wasden case, the court again affirmed that endowment lands must be held in trust to secure, to secure apologize for the typo, the maximum long-term financial return. And then, um, in a case from 2003, the court again talked about that. The land board's been entrusted with the duty to determine the best use or uses to be made of state land in order to carry out the constitutional mandate to secure the maximum long-term financial return. And then there's a public auction requirement. And I don't know that that's going to be um, particularly significant for purposes of today's discussion, but do keep in mind um, that in order to fulfill those obligations that I just talked about, um, there is a public auction requirement because just thinking, you know, sort of basic economic theory, if there's competition, if there's two people that want the same thing and there's competitive bidding, then the person selling that thing is it's gonna to be to their benefit, right? So that was one of the purposes of, of requiring auctions. Um, so competitive bidding is mandatory. 
there, that doesn't mean that there has to be a live auction for every single lease, but there is a process that IDL follows to um, encourage applications and, and to proceed to a, a live auction or a public auction if there is, um, if there are more, if, if there is more than one application um, for a particular lease or a particular sale. Um, and it's, it's unambiguous, um, it's an unambiguous requirement the Supreme Court held. And again, disposal, the language in Article 9, Section 8 is dispose or disposal. It's not sale or it's not lease. So the courts held that, held that disposal means a lease or a sale. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about the statutes. Um, I'm just going to just there's a list here, um, you know, you can certainly, you can find these on the legislature's website. I believe there's links to them from um, IDL's webpage as well. But just generally, um, Title 58 contains a lot of the um, pertinent statutes. The one I want to draw your attention to is perhaps one of the things you've been thinking about is, okay, Angela, so the admission bill and and particularly the constitution talk about the land board. So how is it that IDL is doing all these things? Well, Idaho Code section 58-119 provides that IDL has the power to exercise under their general control and supervision of the land board all the rights, powers and duties vested by law in the land board except the supervision of public investments um, and that's with the Endowment Fund Investment Board. Um, Chris Antone, who's a member of this committee, um, knows all about that. Um, the administration of the Carry Act and then the administration of a repealed provision of the Idaho Code. Title 58, Chapter 3 talks about the appraisement, lease, and sale of lands and sets forth requirements for those processes. Chapter 4 is the sale of timber on state lands. Uh, chapter 11 is real property acquisition. So if the land board wants to acquire some lands for the endowments. Title 47 um, is minerals, law, uh, minerals in general. Chapter seven is mineral rights in state lands. And chapter eight is oil and gas leases in state and school lands. And then IDL also has several administrative rules that pertain particularly to endowment lands, including the selling of timber on, which is a huge source of revenue for the endowments is the selling of timber. And also um, easements, there's rules regarding cottage site leases, um, certain other types of leases that you can see listed here, geothermal leasing, oil and gas leasing. Um, so again, I'm not gonna go into any detail on those today, but. I would invite you to take a look at them if you're you're at all curious or if you have questions about them um, somewhere down the road, I'd be happy to talk about it. So um, with that, um, the next step up, the next uh, topic for discussion is really the implementation. How does IDL accomplish all of those um, constitutional and statutory obligations? And that's going to be handled by Jim Elbin, although I will, I think, maybe turn it back to Scott Phillips in case he wants to say anything additional here. Thank you, Angela. Uh, appreciate the presentation. For everyone who's tuned in today, I'll point out we have kind of a, what I describe as a Cliff Notes version of the legal framework under which the board operates available on the IDL website. That's www.idl.idaho.gov. It's under the About section and Understanding Endowment Lands. With that, I'll turn the floor over to Jim Elvin. Jim? Thanks, Scott. Again, my name is Jim Elvin. I'm the Trust Land Division Administrator. I've been working with the department in various roles for the last 20 years. So much like Angela, I got a short amount of time to cover a pretty huge topic. So what I tried to do is really the high points and hopefully it'll help bring some clarity on you take all the stuff that Angela's presented and then we're building on that to actually do our plan land management planning and strategies. So the first thing, the main driver for the department's planning purposes is defining what the primary asset being managed is. And that could be forest, range, land, commercial, et cetera. The primary asset class determines how the land should be utilized. 
Secondary uses are allowed where those uses do not impede the primary asset class management. An example would be grazing or recreational leases on timberland where we can still you know, pull off our timber harvest silviculture the way we'd want with, and that would not be impeded by the other activity. And then as will be discussed in further detail later, the department has transition lands, which are defined as lands that are not meeting expected returns for that asset class over a predefined period of time that varies by asset type. And that's kind of the key behind this issue in the land and the McCall plan that Ryan presented last month and he's gonna cover further later today. So you, now we have land asset classification. So based on that, the department follows the asset management plan, which was last updated in May of 2016. That plan was introduced at the March 2016 land board meeting, was left open for public comment through the following month. And then during that time, no comments were received and then it was approved at the land board in May. This asset management plan changed recreation, conservation and rights of way from standalone asset classes to activities that occur on the remaining asset classes, which timberland, rangeland, farmland, commercial real estate, and minerals, oil, and gas. This plan also identifies the high level strategies for land transition, land acquisition, disposal strategies, and the utilization of the land bank fund. For forest management, as Angela alluded to, that's a big one. That's a lot of you know, the primary use of the lands around the McCall area. That is the management strategies there are dictated by what we call the forest asset management plan, or you might hear uh, the acronym FAMP. That is scheduled on a five year basis based off latest inventory and growth and yield analysis. The end goal on a statewide basis is to get to a regulated forest, which means we would at some point down the line, we will actually harvest what we're growing and have this distribution of age classes across the forest that we manage. Ag and farmland leases are individually assessed based on current and expected conditions at the stage of lease renewal. Other leasing opportunities are ev evaluated against the primary use and to see if they are compatible or if a reclassification is necessary to better attain the endowment mission of securing the long-term maximum return. Further documents that help us out are, called, are the strategic reinvestment plan and the investment statement of investment policy. These define utilization of land bank funds, which will be discussed later as we discuss the draft of the pay it, this, this plan and this group's function and the gap analysis, which is gonna be important of the transition lands. The strategic reinvestment plan talks overall about exploring opportunities for acquisition given the state of the land, bu land bank fund as it is today. Since there will be a significant balance to reinvest over the next three to seven years. The statement of investment policy utilizes the guiding principles that Angela Kaufman covered in her presentation, and it further defines how the department is to examine trust assets of the various types that we hold. Additionally, some of you are probably aware there's a, what is called the draft pay at Lake land use plan from 1992 that was prepared to go to the land board, never did, but it, it still provides some loose management principles that guide the the Pay at Lakes areas management today. So that's super high level overview, but the really the take home here is, you guys are probably gonna get sick in here of hearing this, but the take home is the endowment assets of Idaho must be managed in such a manner as will secure the long-term financial return to the trust beneficiaries. And so this is done with the following objectives and combines not only the Department of Lands, but also the Endowment Fund Investment Board and as to maximize long-term financial return at a prudent level of risk, provide relatively stable and predictable distributions to the beneficiaries, constrain distributions to protect future generations purchasing power and to maintain sufficient liquidity for anticipated expenditures. And that's what I have for that, Scott. I'll flip it back to you. All right. Well, thank you very much, Jim. That leads us to the question and answer portion of this section of the agenda. Uh, we had two questions come in via the chat function from panelists. The first one is something we're going to cover at the end under next steps. I'm going to pitch this to Sid and have him handle it now. And Diane had asked, uh, what do you imagine the end product of the panelists' efforts? Will our comments be incorporated into the final PELs, or will we create our own document of statements and summaries or some other product? Sid, could you please address that? 
Uh, absolutely, um, and thank you for the question. Um, certainly, uh, you know, our, we understand that this may evolve through this process and through discussions as you know with the group. But our initial anticipation is simply that um, as as we go through this process, in the end, each of you would submit in writing your um, comments and suggestions. Um, which we will incorporate and, and, and provide to the board, but then also we would incorporate, you know, incorporate that into our presentation, but also incorporate those portions that we can based on the rules that we operate within. You know, our, our goal is to improve and make the plan better through this process and through your input. But again, that's, that's within the confines that we operate in. And that's, that's how we anticipate it is, uh, would be, but again, that may evolve through our discussions. All right, thank you, Sid. And panelists are welcome to either uh, speak up and ask your question in the open forum here, or it can be put in through the chat application, I can read it. Um, before you start raising your hands though, we had uh, one more from Diane, and Diane had asked, or excuse me, this one was from, yeah, Diane. Uh, Angela, uh, you discussed disposal by sale and lease. What are the controlling laws and administrative procedures we should know about considering land exchanges? Great question. It is a good question. And um, thank you for asking that, Ms. Grace, because that's something I did sort of gloss over in my presentation. So the authority for exchanges actually starts um, with the Idaho admission bill that I previously discussed. And it provides that lands granted for educational purposes under this act may be exchanged for other public or private lands um, and then that would apply to other endowments too. Um, it, the admission bill provides that the values of exchange lands shall be approximately equal, equal, or if the values are not approximately equal, the values shall be equalized by the payment of funds by the appropriate party. So, you know, that's really kind of the guiding, one of the guiding principles with exchanges is that equal value thing. Um, similarly, the Constitution, again, Article 9, Section 8, also um, provides land board with the authority to exchange granted or acquired lands on an equal value basis um, for other lands under agreement with the United States, local units of government, corporations, companies, individuals, or combinations thereof. So, it's exchanges are specifically authorized under both of those documents. And then um, Jim talked too fast or maybe Scott talked too fast because I was, haven't yet pulled up this specific statutory authority for exchanges. It is, I believe in title 58 chapter three. And if Scott, you wanna move to just another question, I'll find those exact citations and provide that to the group. Will do. So Julie Manning had asked a question through the chat on clients. Why did the asset management plan change recreation from an asset class to activities that occur on other asset classes? Jim, do you want to field that one? Or Sid or Ryan? So Scott, I'd be happy to take that one if you'd like. Thanks, Bill. You bet. So at the time we went through that, uh, the, the endowment owned lands and the land department Department of Lands manages lands uh, for the land board and for the beneficiaries. Recreation is an activity that can happen on, on essentially all of the asset classes. Um, so we can have recreation on timberland, recreation on our rangeland, for example. Um, recreation itself is not an asset class. It's, uh, it's an activity as, as we look at things. All right. Thank you, Bill. While Angela's doing a little bit of research, does anyone else, else have questions? I do. Go ahead. Uh, great, yeah, so, so um, this one may be a question for Angela. It may just be something we wanna put a pin in to, to come back to, but the, the kind of relevance and responsibility of the land board relative to uh, navigable waters and, and public trust lands below those navigable waters uh, seems to be something that would be relevant here, uh, recognizing that none of the proposals are actually talking about transferring title of those public trust lands, but that there could be impacts on those lands associated with the uh, adjacent, um, uh, you know, potential disposal and that, you know, there are several statutes and, and some, uh, you know, case law relevant to considerations about 
how public trust values could be impaired. And I guess a, a question is whether or not um, the department sees any relevance to, uh, or, or any of the, the, um, the AG or representative folks uh, on the call, see any relevance with regards to public trust benefits associated with pay at length. So Jonathan, just to kind of distill your question down a little bit, you're inquiring about the application of public, the public trust doctrine to endowment lands, I think at its core. Well, I mean, actually, to the to the navigable navigable waters. So it would be a, a question of of you know, a Angela, I think, went through and talked a lot about the the fiducial uh, fiduciary obligations that the land board have that I think are are obviously the, the you know the crux of a lot of the discussions that we're having here in terms of determining that future. But I guess I'm just curious whether or not uh, you know the department sees any role for you know shining any light on the public trust responsibilities of the board relative to uh, the navigable waters. Angela, I think we probably hand that question off to you in conjunction with Julie's question as well. You're the popular yes, panelist sir. today. Sure, sure. And to get back to the exchanges, the statutory citation for you, um, if you want to look at those standards, it's Idaho Code Section 58-138. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, so to, to try to not get too, um, too far afield. So the public trust doctrine that uh, Jonathan mentions um, applies to navigable waters, uh, the beds and banks of navigable waters below the ordinary high watermark. Those lands were navigable at statehood. And to tie it back, uh, when Idaho became a state, it took title to the beds and banks of navigable waters below the ordinary high water mark pursuant to the equal footing doctrine. It took title to those subject to a public trust, which is different than the endowment land trust. Um, so those, those specific um, lands and waters are managed for multiple uh, multiple uses and purposes, which you all see that on Payette Lake, right? There's a myriad of uses that occur on Payette Lake. And IDL has a role in, um, in that because of the public trust doctrine and the Lake Protection Act subsequently. Um, so as to the endowment lands, those public trust doctrine values are not directly applicable. Um, it, it is, again, just a, the public trust doctrine is applicable to, to those uh, beds and banks below the ordinary high water mark. Um, you know, that's not to say that uh, there's some good things to be considered re regarding the public trust doctrine. I mean, you know, I think the way to look at it is, um, you know, if IDL is considering a specific action of of course, it, as we all know, you, and you're, you can't help ourselves, you're gonna hear this a lot. It, it, it has to be in the best interest of the beneficiaries. That's the obligation. But you know, Bill also talked about how IDL is able to accomplish that while also allowing other uses to benefit the public, such as recreation on endowment lands. So you, know, you, can, you can think about those principles. Um, now, I don't know that there's really anything in the McCall plan, the plan that we're going to be discussing in a little, in a little while, that necessarily has a, a direct effect where the public trust doctrine would be implicated because, again, it does not apply to endowment lands. Um, but, you know, we could certainly look at that. Um, Scott, I'll just kind of take this next one, if you don't mind. Clive Strong sent a question. And... Um, so I'll, you probably, you can all see it in the chat and it seems like it's um, up my alley. So if you don't mind, Scott, I'll go ahead and take that question. Uh, Club's question for those of you who maybe uh, can't see the chat is, would you please discuss the issue of disguised exchanges for purposes of evading the public auction requirement? Um, you know, and that's a, that's a problem that the land board and IDL have dealt with um, numerous times or I don't know if numerous is the right word, but it comes up from time to time. Um, people will try to call something an exchange as a way to avoid going through a public auction, as a way to avoid that competition aspect that's inherent for endowment lands and endowment resources. 
And, you know, when I, I think for most of you, when you think about an exchange of endowment lands, what you're thinking of is land for land, right? And as we all know from what we saw, it's got to be basically equal value. Well, there's different things people have tried to do over time, um, you know, making complicated transactional things, perhaps involving multiple parties that really end up with uh, what is called an exchange. It would really be a, a disguise sale that violates the Constitution because it evades that competitive public auction requirement. So, you know, by following the statute, the 58-133 that I talked about a little bit ago, ensuring the equal value, um, you know, doing appropriate appraisals, uh, being upfront about those transactions, those are ways that we can ensure that whatever a transaction is, if it's supposed to be an exchange, that it really is an exchange and that it's not a, a sale. Angela. Uh how do you how do you ensure that you achieve the highest value for the land without a bidding uh, or auction process? So on that one, um, I think there's probably just as much a practical aspect as a legal aspect. So I think I would turn that one over to um, uh, either Dustin or Bill or if Ryan Montoya's on the call or Sid, somebody from Lance. I'll let, uh, you know, Bill or Ryan, if you guys want to take that. Go ahead, Ryan. So Brian, are you referring to a situation where you're maximizing uh, the return or the value based on a land exchange? Uh, yeah, that's that's kind of part of it. But how do you determine the value of the exchange land? And how do you ensure that that is the highest value for that land if there's not a public auction process? Sure. And I would probably have to defer back to Angela on the, the sake of the public auction component. But what I can do is talk to you through how we typically value uh, the exchange. So Idaho, Idaho Code 58-138 provides that there shall be uh, two appraisals. Uh, we have to have a MAI appraisal, both on the incoming and outgoing land. And then there's also a review appraisal for both of those properties as well. And so ultimately what it is, is the appraiser who's a third party to the transaction, so not affiliated, would be the one who would value the property based on standard practices in the appraisal field. And so when we're looking at an exchange, we will not direct the appraiser to value the property in a certain way. They have the complete autonomy to value it as they would any other transaction. And as Angela said, the statute requires an equal value exchange. So there are situations where we could have multiple different appraisers where you have perhaps one, uh, the incoming property is farm and the outgoing property is timberland. So you may not have the expertise in one appraiser to value the timberland and the farmland. So there are situations where we could have multiple appraisers involved to get to that value. The, uh, the other component of that, Brian, is the checks and balances that we have with the review appraiser. Uh, that they'll have to do a, a, a review of the appraisals to make sure that they're adhering to the standards. And we also have an internal appraiser who will review them as well, just to make sure that IDL is, is getting a qualified eye on the appraisals. All right. Nick, I think you may have had a question as well. I did. Hopefully you guys can hear me okay now. Is that better? You're still a little garbled. Okay, I've gotten off to make an alternate later. My, my question is regarding the fiduciary duty um, to achieve maximum long term benefit to the beneficiaries. Um, just in looking at the primary beneficiary of the Idaho Department of Lands, it's, it's obviously the public schools, um, more specifically the secondary and elementary school system. Um, in looking at the budget from 2019, for example, um, and I'm going off the top of my head off of something I looked at a long time ago, but I remember the, the school budget being something in the neighborhood of $2 billion um, for that particular year. And the proceeds from IDL timber sales being something in a magnitude of $50 million. 
there, there is a case to be made for best economic use to the beneficiaries of this land um, is actually the long-term economic growth of the state. And that the bulk of that $2 billion that was budgeted to the schools was actually raised through tax receipts, which is through obviously indirectly the growth of the state. So you know, I know different states have taken different views on that with regard to that use for IEL lands or, or, or in debt lands. Um, but I'm, I'm wondering, is that at all and how we should be considering this or it should only be direct benefit to beneficiaries? All right, that's a great question, Rick. thank you. Um, there's a couple of folks on our team who could answer that. I think probably the first person I would ask to chime in would be Angela, because I think there might be some interaction with uh, case law Western Watersheds that could help explain this. Yeah, so I can I can answer that a little bit, um, you know, and I'll preface it by saying that question is uh, one that's been, that has been and will continue to be the subject of uh, lots and lots of law review articles and analysis and debate and, you know, so it's a lengthy topic that could be a whole separate focus group. What I will say, though, is that, um, you know, the, the fiduciary obligation and the obligation to maximize long-term return are, are directly to the endowment beneficiaries. So um, if I understood what you were saying correctly, Mr. Harris, so the nature of your question, you were talking about, you know, shouldn't, wouldn't it be appropriate to focus on the well, the economic well-being of the entire state, because that can ultimately benefit funding for schools and things of that nature. Um, Scott is right. That question was answered in part by uh, the Idaho Watersheds case that I discussed a little while ago. And uh, one of the arguments that was made for that particular code provision, uh, the particular code provision took into account the health of the livestock industry and the benefit to the livestock industry, as well as to the endowments in making leasing decisions. And by extension, one of the arguments was, well, hey, if the livestock industry is doing great economically, then that benefits the state. Uh, the court said, no, what, what you look at in terms of IDL and land board decisions as to endowment beneficiaries is really, you have to look at those endowments. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a huge, um, I don't want to necessarily say, I'll say it and, and just set aside any connotations. Not sort of the trickle down effect um, or the greater macroeconomic principles that you're talking about, Mr. Harris. Um, it's not looking at the greater good of Idaho's economy with the assumption that that's going to help education. It's, you know, these endowments are set up specifically for certain beneficiaries, each of them for different ones. And that's what the focus is, is on the return to those beneficiaries. And then um, anyone else at IDL, if you want to chime in. Thanks, Angela. And I, I really think, too, what, what I heard you describe is the board's undivided loyalty to which they serve the beneficiaries. Uh, we're about 13 minutes behind schedule right now. Jonathan, I saw via the chat you had one more question. So let's handle that one. And then if there's no more questions, we'll move on to uh, Mr. Montoya's presentation of the plan. So uh, Jonathan, you had asked if a statute is deemed in conflict with the land board's fiduciary duty, is there a proactive requirement to challenge those laws or can the land board simply determine the statute conflicts with constitutional duty and can thereby be ignored? Angela, I'll pitch another one to you. Glad to have our attorney here today. <laughs> Yeah, it's amazing how popular one can be at times like this. Um, I'm going to deflect that question a little bit in part because um, some of what you're asking, and Jonathan, I think you probably expected this response. Um, some of what you're asking involves legal advice that uh, we might provide to our client. I'll say just generally there are um, ways to that a, a statute is challenged and overturned just overall and you know, with any agency, with any sort of statute. Um, sometimes those are direct challenges. Sometimes those occur over questions of whether a statute is being appropriately applied or enforced. 
there's a myriad of ways that it can happen. Um, and I think that um, I will just leave it at that for now. Thanks, Angela. I did see one more question come across. If, chat, right? if I if I could, though, you know, just to follow up, I mean, is there, you know, recognizing that that constitutional, you know, fiduciary duty is is really, you know, at the core of the discussion. Is there is there any process to attempt to align some of the strategy with statute as well? I mean, will there be kind of an analysis process that IDL goes through to say, okay, we're we're moving down this path consistent with that fiduciary obligation. Here's an area of statute where this may conflict. Here's an area that it may conflict, or will it kind of ignore those statutory provisions and just stay focused kind of singularly on the, the uh, fiduciary duty? So that's one that I can, I can answer. So RDL and the land board, like any state, the land board's not a state agency, but like anyone, the land board and IDL, like any state agency, um, really starts from the point of following the statutes that are applicable to it. I mean, that's that's where it starts. Um, if there is a conflict, say for example, what we saw, there's a couple different cases that illustrate the different approaches. Okay, so the Idaho watersheds case that I mentioned, that had to do with the validity of a statute. Um, IDL followed the statute and it was challenged by Idaho watersheds and ultimately the court ruled that the statute was unconstitutional. Um, so that's one way. The other way um, was uh, that things can happen is the Wasden case that all of you are probably, many of you are familiar with that I have discussed. Um, and that was a, 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 a little bit of a ground breaking piece of legislation brought by my boss. Um, against the land board at, and also having to do with the validity of a statute. Um, and the, the attorney general asserted um, the land board's obligation to act as trustee and, and follow the constitution. And I think certainly in that, that case, um, you know, the court did say, yeah, that's right, land board, you're, you're the trustee, right? You're the epitomic public trustee. Um, so, you know, um, I, I cannot presume first to, to speak to the land board. The land board makes their own decisions. And Mr. Early, who is on this call, is the land board's counsel. I advise IDL. Um, but I, I think that the general idea is IDL is going to try to follow the statutes that apply that have been provided. But ultimately, IDL and the land board are the trustee. And they have their fiduciary obligations to the endowment beneficiaries. And that's the that's the ultimate obligation. Thanks, Angela. Um, we'll do one last question before we move on to Ryan. This was from Brad Compton. Um, does IDL consider future land values appreciation in weighing whether any specific parcel is meeting long-term financial return obligations? Bill, I see that you've unmuted yourself, so please go ahead. Yeah, Brad. It, um... In short, yes, we do consider appreciation. Um, where it becomes complicated for us is there are certain assets that we, um, for example, timberland, where we are statutorily uh, not allowed to sell timberland. And so if you can never capture the appreciation, um, do the beneficiaries ever receive any value from that, right? So while the land is appreciating, it may not mean anything to the beneficiaries in that way. So that's just a more complicated thing for us than it would be, for example, for an industrial forest manager. Um, you know, a, a large company managing a large ownership where we are a little different in that way, but we do consider appreciation of the assets as we evaluate them. Thanks, Bill. Uh, Ryan, are you ready to take the helm? I am, thank you. And I'll be sharing a presentation. So I hope everybody can see uh, my screen. So we did send over a number of documents and asked the group to review the documents in advance of this meeting. And so part of that was the pay it endowment land strategy. So today I'm not gonna be reviewing the strategy in an exhaustive format. What I'm gonna be doing is touching on some, some high level items and then walking through some examples of how the department works. Ultimately, what my intention is, is to provide you all with an idea of why this can get complicated and how we are trying to make decisions. 
well, we understand that each one of you have your own biases and ideas about what we should do with individual lands. Ultimately, what we're trying to do today is, is ultimately provide you with the background and give you the opportunity to understand and hear what we do and why we do it, and then take that home and come back on the next meeting to really question uh, what we put in the plan, as well as to challenge any of the items that you might have questions on. And so with that, I'll start. All right, so we're currently talking about the 5,000 acres that sit within the McCall's designated area of impact. However, as I've mentioned in, in multiple meetings, the scope of ideal management isn't just the 5,000 acres within McCall's area of impact, but we manage 2.5 million acres of land. And so the way that the department separates its land is through management through different areas. This land is managed under the Payette Lakes Area Office, who oversees 183,000 acres. Of those, approximately 74,000 acres are classified, managed, and hold primary values as timberlands. And so when we're talking about planning, we're talking about planning in, planning in areas that we see growth and obvious issues and concerns with the community, as well as interest from stakeholders and others. When we're talking about the 74,000 or even the 183,000 acres, when you have our primary base that's timberland and the timberland asset class, that's how we're going to continue to manage it. We'll look for opportunities throughout the state anywhere where someone would like to lease. However, trying to pinpoint an acre in the middle of 183,000, let alone 2.5, for some sort of idea on how we should plan for that one acre can be somewhat difficult. So the endowment lands that we're going to be primarily focusing on are those within the areas of impact that are either zoned or used as something other than timberland and identified as areas for growth. Really the key here is the proximity to urban areas making traditional timber management difficult due to view sheds, public safety and conflicts with adjacent uses. So the graphic that you'll see on the presentation is taken from uh, McCall's comprehensive plan. And when we started looking at the plan, we started looking at how McCall views growth. And really that helped us narrow down some of the areas and the parcels specifically that we could see having the highest desirability for future expansion and transitioning into other uses besides just mere timber management. And this is where we get into the problem. So there's a continuing need to evaluate and discuss the future of endowment lands within and immediately outside of the city of McCall's impact area. This is because there's underperforming assets as you've heard uh, that mentioned before and also in this meeting. That is revenue versus asset values commensurate with appropriate asset returns. So there's a value that a parcel may have that is not returning the value that we would typically shoot for as a benchmark based on the potential uses. There's also inconsistency between current asset classification and local planning. So the land board has the authority to direct the department to do certain activities which may not align with certain, certain jurisdictional designated areas in a comprehensive plan such as certain zoning requirements. And then also the public's understanding of the endowment mission. Well, uh, many of you that are on the call today understand and have the background of the endowment. As you heard Dustin provide in an example that people often mistake us for the Forest Service or some other federal agency whose mission is to provide public services. And while the public does have access to a majority of our lands, ultimately, as you've heard in multiple times today, that it's the maximum returns to the endowment that's critical. So the plan. So the plan is basically identifying transition lands in a community context that require long range valuation. This is immediate management decisions need to be made in the context of long term community and market contexts. A phased approach allows revenue generation today while considering potential future opportunities and trends. So that involves a short term plan, medium term plan and long term plan. And the reason why we've created these phases 
is due to the, the growth, knowing that every acre within the 5,500 is not going to be either accessible or potentially ripe for consumption right this minute. So what we've tried to do is align our expectations with the city of McCall's growth patterns. And that's where you get the phase one, phase two, and phase three properties. Phase one property being a short-term plan, that's one to five years. I've heard it in the media and other places that this is where we are planning to develop and that there's gonna be massive developments that we're gonna be doing within these areas. It's not true. All we're saying is this is what our primary focus is gonna be for properties that are ripe for some sort of activity, whether that's leasing, whether that's something that we can derive revenue from that can increase revenue while also minimizing the gap. The goal here is to transition these properties that are underperforming, have higher and better uses. The surrounding uses include utilities, infrastructure, and zoning that are prescribed to promote other potential uses, and also based on market conditions that provide for absorption opportunities. While we don't act like developers, we do consider what's going on in the marketplace and try to time the market the best we can. Uh, you know, some of that is looking at what's available on the market today to understand what's going to happen if we were to put some properties on the market. We certainly don't want to have adverse effects to the market because that would be detrimental to our, our efforts as well as the community as well. So for example, if we were to go out and throw out a thousand acres just for development of residential, that could have substantial effects on um, the economic conditions of development in those areas. This is also um, what we're talking about today is the revenue generated from transitional lands and the financial gap. And I'll discuss that here shortly. Some of the processes that I'll be discussing are regarding leases, uh, other lease opportunities, disposition and land exchanges. So the medium term plan or the phase two is really a five to 10 year plan where we're looking at growth outside of those. Uh, some, some ways that we gauge that is where are the infrastructure uh, opportunities now. So there's a lot of lands that we have that don't have access. So if there's gonna be access in the future, that would be another example of how we'd gauge that it would be more in a five to 10 year plan. Another situation is whether or not there's utilities where it doesn't make sense for us to sell residential when you can't hook up or there's other restrictions that would cause any issues for those types of uses. Long-term plans are those that are really outside of the immediate growth or that have other issues that would need quite long-term planning, for example, lack of access or other issues. So implementation. So the goal is to move forward with marketing for phase one properties with the intention to be transitioned for increased revenue. That includes hiring experts to help with that as well as land board approval where proposed uses are different from tra traditional management. And when we say traditional management, we're talking about what we do um, at the legacy. So uh, timber management, grazing, minerals, those types of activities, and then identify phase two and three properties. And then also coordinate additional planning for phase two and three properties with updates to local jurisdiction planning documents. So we don't necessarily wanna be creating a plan that's completely contrary to the local jurisdiction because that's just right off the bat creates conflict. So how to close the gap. So the land, the Department of Lands can close the gap through different land activities, including, including leasing, and that's options that allow a hold due to revenue producing activities. And this is, of course, dependent on the market and applicant. So when we're talking about leasing, there has to be a lessee. So just because we think something is ripe, ripe and ready to be leased, it doesn't matter if we don't have an applicant or no one wants to lease the ground, then it's just fallow. We also have opportunities such as disposition and reinvestment. And there's a discussion of the financial assets versus the land and what that does. And if any of you have been watching over the past year, uh, the discussions that have been going on between the financial versus the land assets, you'll see that there's some benefits to having land assets um, compared to financial assets. And if there's any questions, then Crass Chris Antone of BFIB could provide some more clarity on that as well. And then land exchange. So when we're looking at land exchanges, there's really three primary reasons for the department to pursue a land exchange. And I'll get into that uh, further down as well. I'm gonna be running through some examples, please. And this is, I, I'm gonna stress this. These are examples to illustrate land activities and the analysis 
uh, for these situations. They're not proposals or recommendations. And so ultimately what we're doing is trying to provide examples that you can couple to, to be able to make an assessment of where we're going with some of these planning ideas. But in no means are we pitching some of these options. So closing the gap. So there's a financial gap between revenue generation and asset value commensurate with Timberland. And the reason why we're using Timberland is because the majority of those lands around McCall within the 5,500 are classified as Timberland. Now, it's probably worth noting that the department does have an internal way to reclassify the asset. And that has its own process. But when we look at assets, we have to look at the highest and best use. And unless there's no other use that's prescribed, like the timberland, then it's going to stay in timberland designation. However, if we look at cottage sites, for example, we see that the best use is for residential and that asset may be within a timbered area, but classified as residential because that's its high, highest and best use. So here's an example of parcel G where we have a situation that it's currently vacant and there's no revenue that's being produced for this parcel. And you'll see the current annual revenue is $0. The current estimated value, which is an appraised value that we have from last year is 9.7 million. We're basing this on a target rental rate. So the appraisal indicated that the highest and best use for this is residential. Even if we were just using it as an example, we would use a baseline of 4% just as a way to indicate whether or not we were hitting that return. This means that based on zero return, 4% of 9.7 gets us to around 388,000 that we should be making on that parcel. So underperforming. So what, do, what does the department look at when it considers the next move? Well, it's 20, 21 acres in an area that's highly desirable, has a crazy amount of frontage, um, 3,100 lineal feet, and so what does that look like? And what are ways that the department can maximize the value? And so this would be similar to what a developer or anybody in the private industry would do when they're looking at a parcel that they own is to uh, have a value added situation. So what the department would do is go to the local jurisdictions, determine what the utilities are and the infrastructure is and try to come up with a solution so that it could be marketable in some way. So here you have a situation where you have a single lot that's approximately 24.8 acres at approximately 9.7 million. Well, based on the topography and the survey that we have, it looks like there could be four locations where you could have 16,000 square foot building site. Well, does that mean that our current single lot is appropriate or should we be looking at three distinct lots? All right, so if we look at three distinct lots, we would have to increase the acreage due to the equivalent, um, so the EDUs, so the sewer capacity in that area, which requires 11 acres per lot. So that means that we have to increase the acreage, but what does that do to the overall value? We're now looking at a value of approximately uh, 10.6 million. So just by doing some due diligence and looking into the prospect of increasing the lots, we've added value. However, we get into a policy situation. We've also been directed to dispose of cottage sites. So now if we're saying that we're gonna offer cottage sites, what does that look like when we've been instructed to dispose of cottage sites? So we're at a bit of an impasse when it comes to those types of questions. We also have a situation where we can have four lots. So based on the topography and the uh, site plan, it looks like we can have four buildable lots. So if we do that, then we're in a situation where we would be needing to include additional lands, which we have on the opposite side of Eastside Drive. So now we've expanded across Eastside Drive, which might look a little funky, but just for the concept and the sake of the discussion, we're now talking about four lots that are legally um, within the jurisdiction. And that estimated value is then 12.3 million. We continue to add value with different situations. And again, disclaimer, hypothetical situation. The department is not pitching that we're gonna put 16 lots on uh, parcel G. This is just for the sake of understanding the complexities that we're dealing with when we're trying to provide different options in different situations. 16 lots, you have the frontage foot, which is where you're getting your value. 
It looks crazy and we don't know whether this would even be marketable, but let's just say for the, say for the sake of it, we could reroute the road, everything would be beautiful. You have 16 lots, now you're talking about a potential for $21 million. Again, example, just to show you the type of situations we have to go through when we're doing an evaluation to really determine how do you best use that property. Maybe it's not residential purposes. Maybe the best use is just right next door like the Tamarack Bay Condos Association to have condos and that maximum density. You have all sorts of problems and other issues that you have to look at, just like infrastructure. Can the sewer handle it? What's the sewer cost to increase it to hold the capacity? There's, what about a hotel? I mean, when we're looking at this, if you're exempt from local zoning requirements, you almost have a blank slate to try and design or come up with ideas in order to maximize the returns. So here's a, a quick example. I'm gonna stop sharing real quick and then show you another screen. So please bear with me. So here's an example of a financial analysis, and I apologize to all the financial people on this call who have a lot more experience than I do, but just for the sake of rudimentary analysis, just to see as an example, we have some different situations. So this is again, parcel G. Scenario A is a disposition. We sell the one lot, sale, it's gone. Uh, the money is then reinvested in EFIB. We're using a 6.5% return, which is, I think, an average annualized return over a 20-year period for EFIB investments. It might be off a few points, but I think we're close. So you look at the yearly increase in value, and that's on a cumulative basis. Your value at year 10, assuming 6.5%, rate of return is approximately 82 uh, increase in value is roughly eight and a half million or an 88% return. Let's say scenario B, where we've done the three lots. So the three lots, the market value is 10.5 on a 6.5% return. Over 10 years, you're looking at the value of 19.8. The increase in value is 9.2, 88% increase in value. You have a residential lease. So here's a situation that we actually get approval to lease these as cabin sites. So you have parcel A, B, and C, which we've talked about the three distinct parcels, each one of those having its own value based on frontage foot. We're gonna apply a 3% land appreciation rate. That's gonna be a cumulative based on the yearly increase in value as well as a land lease rate with a 3% CPI escalator of approximately 4%. So you do that and get to a situation where the market value is 10.5. Um, originally, you have the value at year 10, assuming the 3%, so that gets you to 14.2. You have the additional leasing revenue, so the 4% with 3% CPI. So you're gonna have roughly $4.8 million worth of lease payments that gets you to um, approximately 18, uh, 19 million, around 19 million. And so that's uh, roughly an 80% return. So you have these different situations um, that we look at. And so when we're doing an analysis, we run through these types of scenarios to see, okay, how do we maximize returns? Is it through leasing? Is it through dispositions? We've heard that there's a benefit to retaining the land, but what does that really mean uh, in terms of making sure that we're getting a return because we just talked about the annual return on this asset is zero. All right. All right going back to the PowerPoint. All right, so Angela touched on this much more Detailed than I did. So leasing. So leasing has its own nuances, which Angela provided. Uh, some of that is regarding the statutes that require the auction of a lease. Um, so when there's more than two persons or more than one person who applies for a lease, then we'll auction off the lease. So this is very different from the private industry where you can go and, and do a lease with a, another party. If we have more than one person, then we're going to be auctioning. Now that opens up its own nuances, which means that we're in the process, does the department start working with that party to develop a lease? And that's gonna happen in different ways based on the different lease type. 
Angela went through the different sections of the Constitution as well as statutes. Um, she mentioned the rules and then, of course, Waston. So there's many, many different requirements that we work within when it comes to our processes. We have the different activities may require different processes and documents. So that's, again, another disclaimer. So one shoe doesn't fit all when it comes to leasing. We do have a number of different activities and lease types that aren't promulgated within the rules, including commercial recreation, commercial office retail, commercial ground lease. We do have the rules that cover the grazing, farming, conservation, non-commercial recreation, and communication site leases that have a lot of the requirements embedded within those rules. So the lease process generally. So this is a process that's more akin to the those that have the rules. So we have land that's available for lease. This graphic is a, a web based system that allows for the public to review what's available for lease and what's coming up. Realistically, uh, we have 2.5 million acres of land for lease, as long as it's not under a lease that would have a uh, conflicting use. So we're, uh, we're open for business. We also, the next step is to advertise for application. So you'll see there's different colors within here. There's different shapes as well on the website that shows where the process is for that specific lease. Then we have the application, notice of auction, auction, and lease. So we're gonna do a quick example of a leasing scenario of a property that's in uh, Boise. It's Ada County zoned C2D general commercial. So this is a property that the department refers to as airport seven seven due to the acreage, even though it's not exact. You'll see that it really is uh, defined in three distinct parcels. Um, if you look at this map, you'll see that there's some cars parked over here. We've had a land use permit that um, where Hertz was renting some space, but is no longer using it. Um, this is right next to the airport. So in a pretty high growth, high density area, we do have uh, issues with people parking here, um, but that's just land management issues. So when we're looking at a parcel, we have this situation where you have seven acres in a density area that people really want to use. And so when we're looking at this type of leasing operation, we have to ask ourselves, well, what's, how are we going to put this to market? Are we going to say, well, someone has to lease only A, B, or C parcel? Are we going to offer it as a whole? Um, are we going to put any restrictions if this is commercial? What if someone wants to do a, a hotel or a restaurant or a sporting goods store here? Well, it's, it's within C2D, but ultimately it's the landlord's dire direction on, on what we should do. So what we're going to do is we're going to put it out there and provide the public with some information. And so this is a real life example of what we have done and are currently doing. So we'll create a sign and a property information packet on our website that provides information on the parcel. So you'll see that we have some land that's available for lease, some general information about it and then the, the process that we typically go through. One of the difficulties with how the department operates different than the private world is that because we're under time constraints in terms of, of how we can auction and, and the requirements for certain due diligence and so forth, we found that it's in our best interest to provide as much information as we can to the public prior to moving forward with any application. What that usually gets us um, is an application and then in some sort of form, an RFP or an LOI. So a letter of intent or uh, a proposal. So here uh, you can see that on airport seven, back in February of 2019, we received a couple. And these are only two of the, um, that, the LOIs that we received. So we put it out there for the market and said, hey, bring us an idea. We said, we're not gonna say it has to be restricted to anything. You just give us your, your best, highest and best, and, and we'll go from there. So when we did that, we got back a couple of different options. So the first on the um, this side, you'll see that we have the, the full size, 6.7 acres. Uh, that's similar here. They want seven acres. All right. Um, zoning matches the, the zoning lease term. So 20 years, so a 20-year option to extend. Well, uh, constitutionally and statutorily, we have issues with options, but that's okay. They didn't realize that. Um, you'll see here that this person wants 50 years, and then they also want to have the right to terminate after the fifth year, and then the, 
um, the first right of refusal basically to purchase, which is um, arguably unconstitutional. So we have some, some conflict there. Annual rent, 35,000. Annual rent over here, uh, 120,000, so quite a disparity. Um, and then we have use. So here we have this applicant who wants to have AAA tenants, uh, which would include uh, buildings. Uh, this applicant wants a commercial parking lot. So now we're talking about a completely different use where you have a potential site for buildings and an office complex compared to a commercial parking lot. So now we have, okay, what type of disturbance is there gonna be? Uh, this happens to be on an old city of Boise landfill. So that could be a problem. Um, we also have problems uh, or situations where you're gonna have different infrastructure. So now if you're talking about an office building, your office building is gonna have utilities that are coming on site, which could provide um, some value in the future as well as improvements we could, which could provide. Um, value as compared to a parking lot where you're just going to scrap it, level it, asphalt it, put in some street lights and maybe some gates. Um, so what does that look like in value? Um, how about the other proposals um, that we got on this? So we got another proposal for a memorial that wants an, an acre. So now we're talking about carving up uh, the seven acres into six or five. And what does that do to the overall value? Uh, how, how should we be looking at that? Are, are they going to be able to compete and are they competing whole or partially? Um, and then what if there's additional proposals for housing, industrial or hospitality? How are we supposed to evaluate those? And ultimately what it comes down to um, is that we would need to look through all of the different RFPs, the LOIs come up with the one that it's in, uh, our determination or with the help of an advisor, the best return for the endowment and present that to the landlord for its decision. So what's next? So next is you go from RFP LOI to choosing the proponent who provide the most desirable terms to develop a lease. Well, I'm sure many of you who have dealt in the private world with developing a lease, it's not that easy. Just imagine uh, developing it with the state, it gets even more complicated. Uh, and confusing. So once you do that, you get to work with the Attorney General's office um, with uh, the assistance of IDL as well. Then you go to auction. So you've put in all this time, you've probably done some due diligence, you have quite a bit of uh, money that's spent to get to where you are, not including uh, working with probably lawyers to develop the lease. And now you're at auction. And once you're at auction, uh, someone else comes along who was another applicant outbids you. Uh, well, they get the lease now and uh, they're off to the races. And so they're basically acquiring that same lease that was built or um, created. Um, and that's what auctioned off. It's not, we're not auctioning off terms of the lease. It's that document now is the owner of the, the winner of that auction. And then we issue the lease. So what happens if it's not the original applicant? or the original concept that wins at auction. So let's just say we, our original concept was a park. Um, unfortunately, if that's not the original concept that is ultimately decided to be in the best interest, or if the original applicant wasn't the one who uh, was the successful bidder at auction, you get your money back for the application. So that's uh, the issue with leasing. There's a lot of risks, there's a lot of nuances to it. Uh, and it can be uh, a bit complex. So land exchanges, we did have some questions on land exchanges. Ultimately, it's at the discretion of the land board, whether it's in the state's best interest to do an exchange. Uh, typically, we'll exchange full fee. However, we can reserve mineral rights if there's some reason to do so. Uh, there are a number of statutes as well as um, other sources where laws uh, derive us of how to us how to act with land exchanges. Ultimately, the three requirements for a land exchange are to block up endowment lands. So we have scattered parcels throughout the state. Those make management difficulty. So ultimately, if we can block up, uh, similar to what we did in the Waihee land exchange, where we were able to take, uh, I think it was over 40 distinct parcels and create 11 parcels. Uh, that's an example of blocking up as well as gaining access. So there's a number of parcels that we own that don't have legal access. So if we're able to exchange into a situation where we have access, uh, that's another key 
to a land exchange and then always increase revenue or returns. So those are the big three when it comes to land exchanges. So what the plan is not. So the plan is not a property specific plan. And I can't tell you the amount of phone calls that I've had where people have ideas on a specific parcel, but ultimately this plan is not for that. And here's why. The department manages 2.5 million acres of land, plans that provide direction to the department that are specific to that type of management. So an example that you heard from um, Division Administrator Elbin is the Forest Asset Management Plan, which really discusses how the department manages timberland. So we have a significant land holding in timberland, uh, but the largest land holding and asset class is rangeland, which we have other plans that direct the department how to manage that. Some lands have attributes that deviate from traditional management. So those are the transition lands that we're talking about. Those lands require individual action, which varies upon each property. What I'm saying here is that we can't just uniformly apply some sort of fix to every single parcel that looks like transition lands. Each one is different. Land use is primarily dependent on market conditions and desired use. If we don't have an applicant and we don't have a lessee, then we don't have any use on our ground and it's sitting fallow. Ultimately, that's what we're talking about today is that we have a plan that talks about lands that are underperforming and what is the best way for the department to try and get those into a situation where they are performing. Additionally, the department does not act like a developer or the private industry. We're not going out there and cutting in roads, installing utilities. We're not selling individual parcels like you see in many developments. We will take some actions that look like we may be doing things as a developer or private industry like platting or other types of value added activities. But ultimately our goal is to transition the property into some other use and, and increase value. Additionally, any constraint on property use could be contrary to law. For example, limiting leasing to one activity may preclude other opportunities that could produce higher returns. This I think is pretty critical to when we talk about individual parcels. We've heard a lot of people that say that just put that property as conservation or identify that property for only commercial uses. Well, that's fine, but the moment that we encumber that property with one specific use, we're potentially creating a conflict between another use that could produce higher returns. Um, this is also true when we talk about leasing. Leasing, the lease process allows for multiple uses <clears throat> as long as they're not conflicting with each other. We'll typically do this when we stack leases. So for example, we'll have a geothermal resource and then we'll have a grazing lease on the ground and then we will have a cell site. So you could have one parcel that has three different activities on it. And then exemption from local zoning. So this is another area where it's difficult for us to uh, move in a way that restricts land, one, based on uses, but also is ex it just specifically to the local zoning. While we wanna be partners with the local jurisdictions, ultimately we have to present and make sure that the land board approves our proposed use regardless of whether it is in accordance to the local zoning or not. Uh, so that's why uh, this isn't a property specific plan. And then it is not a proposal to sell, develop or dispose. So the department will evaluate properties on a case by case basis to determine how each action will result in returns for the endowment. So we're not trying to pitch this plan as a disposition plan. We're trying to increase returns so that we can minimize that gap. So the next steps. So February 12th, 2021 is the end of the public plan commenting. Uh, if we need to extend this, then uh, we would probably do so. Uh, that would be uh, approved by the IDL executive team and leadership. In March, April present to the land board for final approval of the plan. And this is where some of those questions we're asking, what's the intention of the group? Ultimately, what we're hoping to do is, is bring uh, some comments back from the group. Uh, I don't know that everybody's going to agree within the group. We have conservation groups, we have development groups. Um, I don't know whether we would have a unified letter or some sort of summary that says everybody wants this to happen. But what we plan to do is summarize the comments that we receive and the feedback in order to provide that information to the land board for consideration. 
especially if some of that uh, discussion or commenting is regarding a change to the plan, which would require us to go back through and revise anything. Next steps would be to remove the moratorium on non-traditional leasing types, begin marketing, accepting applications, work through any outstanding or pending lease applications, begin the process for phase two and three properties for individual site plans and begin discussions with local jurisdictions and stakeholders on ideas, concepts for revenue producing activities. If, if we're able to increase revenue and get with some of the local uh, stakeholders and there's some ideas and ways to do this collectively, um, that would be great. And so that would be uh, in essence what we're trying to accomplish by increasing revenue. So it seems like a lot of members of the public that I've talked with do have ideas on potential ways to increase revenue. However, that's probably more um, you know, that's probably going to be on more of the property specific discussion. And that's what I have. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Scott. Helps if I unmute myself. Thank you, Ryan. Um, we've also actually got us ahead of schedule at this point. According to our agenda, we are slated to take a break at uh, one or 2.55. It's uh, 2.50 right now. So let's go ahead and take the 15 minute break that we've uh, got on the schedule. We'll resume at 3.05 p.m. Mountain Time. Um, also, I know that Diane has a couple questions that she would like to ask. And then Bob Looper has one in the queue, and we'll begin with those when we return from break. So that work for everyone? All right. Well, thank you. Four, we'll give the remaining participants about a minute to re-engage on the meeting and then we'll get started. Scott, if you're intending to talk to all of us, you're muted. You'll have to trust me when I say I had the most amazing speech I just delivered, and you'll never hear anything quite as eloquent again in your entire lives. Um, it's a shame that I wasted it to a muted microphone. So uh, it's 3.05. We'll go ahead and begin the next portion of our, our presentation today. And it's going to change dramatically. This is, uh, is going to be all about you. But before we start fielding the questions you may have, I want to acknowledge that the IDL team has covered a lot of ground and provided a ton of information to you. Um, we understand this can take some time to digest this. So I want you to know that today you don't have to have all your questions ready because uh, we hope that in the, the coming weeks before our next meeting, when we reconvene, that you can take some time and digest and kind of mull things over and figure out what the next questions need to be and the next steps could look like for this group as well. So uh, you don't have to have all your questions in place today. We're gonna make sure that we have plenty of time to listen to you. Because after all, um, we, we've asked you for your advice and we need to listen to it. And we, we really wanna hear what you have to say and we're interested in hearing what you think of the plan and maybe ways that we could help uh, shape it into something even better for the endowment beneficiaries. 
Um, that said, uh, and then when we wrap up, um, I will call on Tammy uh, to present uh, what the next meeting agenda will look like. We'll just give you a sneak peek at that right before we call it a day. So uh, Bob Looper had a question. Has IDL calculated the dollar value that the McCall area endowment lands are underperforming? Bill, are you on the line right now? Yes, you are. I am, Scott. Um, and that, that calculation has been made, but but not based on appraised values of those properties at this point. We have some estimated values, uh, internal estimates of what the values of those properties are. And based on that, we know approximately what that number is. And Ryan could probably tell us off the top of his head, but um, but until we get an actual value established for those parcels, we don't know the exact number that we're underperforming. Thanks, Bill. Diane. But you have a you have a target in mind, I'm sure, Ryan and Bill, that you've been working with because in order to you know define transitional lands, you know, and so can you share that with us, roughly? Yeah, uh, Ryan, do you remember that number? Yeah, so Mr. Looper, I would say that it would be a safe estimate to say that based on the 5,500 acres that just, again, this is, we don't have appraisals on many of these. I think we have right. three appraisals um, on Cougar, Shellworth, and Parcel G, so maybe only um, 30 to 40 acres, but just based on some old numbers that we've used in the range of about 85 million, and that's rough, 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 rough. Uh, we would definitely need to ground that through appraisals. That's how much, Ryan, just as a point of clarity, that's how much they're underperforming year over year or yeah. the total value? No, that's just the total value. I would have to go back through the plan and, and do some calculation um, and get back to you all on what we anticipate that underperformance total to be. Diane, I saw in the chat that you had two questions, one for Ryan. Yes, thank you. Uh, Mr. Montoya, I'd like you to go back to the very beginning of your presentation. We have 183,000 acres in the Pale Lake Supervisory Area. Um, let's subtract 7,000 for what's in the area of impact and 73,000 for Timberland. Could you provide for the forum group what the asset management class is for approximately the remaining 104,000 acres? And as a corollary to that, and this may be more of a political question, I know that there were some comments by the Secretary of State and perhaps another member of the land board when you had your presentation in December about the fact that the plan didn't address the areas in the Pale Lake Supervisory Area that were not within the McCall Area of Impact. What kind of weakness do we have in this plan if we don't to some extent address some of these lands that are not within the area of impact. Thank you. And so the additional acreage that you're referring to is not included in the presentation because the distinction that I was making is between primary timber base and then the area of impact. But that remaining acreage is secondary timber base and, and other assets. And so Scott Corkle could probably provide a little bit more detail if you'd like a further breakdown. But um, it's all primarily timber, but we're saying we have 70 some thousand acres that are on the primary timber base. And then the timber guys could probably tell you a little bit more about the distinction between primary and secondary. Um, but we also have some of those acreages that have other leases. So we do have grazing leases out there. We have mineral leases, um, commercial recreation leases, some of those other activities that would be included in that other acreage as well. So the second question was regarding the Secretary of State's comments regarding the additional Hi, acres. Oh, is he? Yeah. Okay, let me call him. Homer. The additional acreage that wasn't accounted for within the plan, and so I can't speak on behalf of the uh, the secretary, but ultimately, what it comes down to is we have the other plans that really cover that type of, of land. So we have the forest forest asset management plan that would be the primary plan that would handle those primary timber bases and secondary timber bases. So. For us to expand beyond just the areas of growth that we see as primary would be us stepping into areas that are going to be managed as timber unless there's some other reason why to evaluate those. Thank you. 
Ryan, are those transition lands as well outside of the Malak Kamal impact area, the 5,500? Are they underperforming? So it's my understanding, and I'll, I'll defer to either Bill or, or Scott on this, that they're not underperforming because they're being managed in timber. Some of the hurdles that we have within man, for timber management within the area of impact is that, for example, on parcel G, um, while it has timber, it's really it's going to be hard to be marketable. And so it's hard to even get the timber value out of that. Plus we have some other policies internally, maybe not that have been approved by the land board that make it difficult to manage as well for viewshed and other reasons. Um, however, I would like to point out, and, and this is a good question that you, you've you asked Mr. Looper is, can those other areas outside of the 5,500 be considered as transition? The answer is yes. Any land that is not being used for its traditional asset class would be transitioned if it's used for a different purpose. So let's say, for example, we decided to have a commercial area next to a hot spring and have buildings that included um, some sort of rental, you know, yurts or whatever. Um, that would no longer be seen as the traditional timber management for a number of reasons, including you'd probably need to clear down some of the timber, you'd have access in there. You're all, also, your revenue structure is different. So we would be looking at recouping the difference in value for that uh, potential use. So we would view it as a commercial use as opposed to a traditional timber type of use, which would then move it into a category of more of a traditional lands situation. Thank you, Ryan. Um, so Jonathan, you have two questions you've submitted through chat. I think I'm going to uh, probably handle the first one and the second one I'll, I'll pitch it to Bill if that's okay. So you'd asked, uh, understand the intent to simply shift asset classes from timberland forestry to transition lands and then avoid the limits of Idaho Code 58-133. Can you discuss whether that is consistent with legislative intent of 58-133? I think on that one, it's it, that question would really fall more into a legal inquiry, a legal question that's probably outside the scope of today's uh, focus group. But what I can tell you is that the board and the department work very closely to discuss issues like this and matters with our legal representation before taking action. So Bill, that said, his second question was, is appreciation of assets appropriately considered a component of returns or is returns synonymous with receipts in ideal strategic reinvestment plan and other plans? Uh, yes, uh, appreciation is considered a part of returns for the asset classes where we've been able to um, calculate and where we think it's appropriate that appreciation is a part of returns. And, and the reason why to date we have not done that with timberlands is because we, we generally, well, we're statu the statutes say we can't sell them um, and, and so we can't capture that um, appreciation. We are looking at a, a, a redetermination of value of the timberland asset class. And that, when that happens, uh, presumably there would be appreciation that would then be factored in as part of the returns um, as we move forward. So uh, I think in short answer to your question, Jonathan, where appropriate appreciation is part of returns. It's not just cash returns. And a quick follow up on that then. So if I'm understanding it right, for the, I guess the question would be is, are some of the lands that have been identified for potential disposal in the near term as a result of their uh, shortcomings to achieve that hurdle rate, because they are classified as timberland, you can't count that as appreciation, but is there a way to consider whether the appreciation, the, you know, increasing asset value of those lands is actually achieving that hurdle rate and whether it may be in the fiduciary interest of the endowment to retain those lands. I guess it kind of seems to me that we're saying, you know, okay, they're not bringing in enough receipts and revenue. So we need to look at potential disposal, but we're missing that consideration of their obvious increase in value. I mean, there's a reason that so many people want to buy these and because it is, they are so valuable. Yeah. Um, certainly um, for certain parcels, um, holding lands and allowing them to continue to appreciate may be an appropriate strategy as we look at them parcel by parcel. I can't speak to each one at this point. Um, so, so that is 
uh, potentially true. For us, the, the difficult part, as I mentioned earlier, is um, actually capturing the appreciation to actually provide some benefit uh, for the endowments. And for us, at this time, that can't happen until they go from timberland into some other asset class. That's, that's when the actual appreciation of value happens in terms of realized appreciation. So we're, we're just a little different than, than certain other large landowners in that way. It's a little more complicated for us. All right, thank you, Bill. Bob, you had a, a fairly long question and um, I'll go ahead and read the whole thing and we'll get this out and answer. I suspect that Ryan, you may want to be the one or Bill could feel this as well. Um, it seems like the board has discretion to determine if an exchange is preferable over the disposal of property, which was defined as a lease or sale at auction. Yet the standard always comes back to maximize the long-term financial gain, which by recent history in the McCall area has been determined by competitive auction. Both processes involve appraisals, one to set a minimum bid, as in the cottage site lease auctions. The exchange also involves multiple appraisals, but then no auction to determine if in fact the appraisal was in fact the maximum financial gain achieved by the property. There must be some pivot point that I'm missing which swings this to an exchange opportunity as opposed to a disposal opportunity. So Mr. Looper, this is a, a very interesting question and I will definitely have to have Angela participate because there's some legal nexus to what you're asking. Um, we have an interesting situation where the Constitution and statutes provide and allow for an exchange. But there is that, um, that distinction between maximum returns, which you may not get on a land exchange because it's not put out to the public, and the situation where <clears throat> you have a auction where ultimately you're saying that that opportunity for anybody else to participate is your guarantee that that's your maximum return at that time, right? There's the event of the sale. Um, so internally process wise, I think that's, I can answer that question, but I can't answer the distinction for the legal question that you're asking of how, how come we don't have to offer it for bid. Um, so procedurally, when we're looking at land exchanges, we will look at the benefits to the endowment primarily as what does that bring? And there is the distinction between um, a land exchange and a disposition where we are able to acquire another parcel that does add value. So there is the increase in value that may not be shown in terms of dollars, but other reasons. So for example, the Hawaii land exchange. So the Hawaii land exchange was effectively uh, 60,000 acres 30 and 30 on the BLM side going into the Department of Lands and then the state disposing out of roughly 20. So in that situation, there the value was effectively the same minus $30,000, but there is an unrealized increase that is hard to quantify. And that is now all of those lands have legal access. Now we have parcels that are blocked up which reduce management costs, which make it more efficient for us to manage our lands and also allow us to increase returns through additional offers to the marketplace and leases that now make those lands more desirable. So when we're doing an evaluation, that's why we're trying to check all three boxes to make sure that they withstand those tests. So that would be procedurally how I could answer your question. Um, but I'll defer to Angela on the distinction between the purchase or the auction and a land exchange in terms of just market value. Yeah, so actually, I think, I think really in a lot of ways, although maybe he didn't realize it, Ryan kind of answered the legal question too. Um, you know, in terms of why there's not a public auction requirement on exchange, you know, it's, it's, it's just not present in any of the pertinent documents. I mean, that's the, the straight up legal answer. Um, you know, the, the other component is, and this really gets back into probably more Ryan's, um, Ryan's shop, but every, every transaction I think is, it would need, is somewhat unique and the opportunities 
um, are all evaluated on their own merits. I mean, th th that's this part of the process. You know, I, I heard IDL say, and you're going to hear this a lot too, that, you know, what, what you have before you and that we're going to be discussing for the next few meetings is a plan. You know, it's not a, okay, we're going to take parcel G and sell it, or we're going to do all this stuff, you know, it's, so everything's um, evaluated on its own merits. Um, you know, there's something to what you say, Mr. Looper, about, you know, if it's an exchange, you don't have that public auction component of competitive bidding. Um, what IDL does is, you know, and I think the Owyhee Land Exchange that Ryan just described is a good example, is they take a look at a proposed exchange and they determine, okay, does it set up or does it fulfill these policy purposes that we operate under for exchanges, the blocking up and all of those sorts of things? Does it enhance value to the endowments that way? Um, you know, so that that's part of it. The equal exchange, the, the appraisal, equal value exchanges, the appraisals. Um, you know, it's, it really just depends on a particular uh, transaction. It's not a, it's not a pure legal question. It's, it's one of um, analysis and the land board acting as the fiduciary land board, IDL, uh, relying on experts, which IDL does in many of these transactions. Um, for appraisals and, and different things. So, you know, is there a pivot point? I don't I don't know that for sure. But there, it's a it's not a simple inquiry, regardless of whether it's a, a sale type of transaction, a lease, or an exchange. Thanks, Angela. Uh, Brad Compton had a question. I think this would probably be directed to Ryan. We've heard the plan is not prescriptive, but provides general guidance and processes. Regarding the Pell's draft on the IDL website, it defines specific parcels, timelines for action, and likely disposition. I'm confused. And I think what Brad is referring to is uh, Roman numeral section five. I think it starts on page 15 of that PDF document we posted online. Ryan, and that doc, actually, I can share that right now on my screen. Tell yeah, I have it up. So, so what we've tried to do is identify certain parcels that we believe to be within an area of growth that are ripe for transition. And so we've tried to separate those into three different phases so that we can identify and work towards getting those as a priority. So earlier I said we managed 2.5 million acres and I have a direct staff of six and two of those are in real estate. And so we have to be able to manage certain projects in a, in a way that's realistic. And for us, a way to look at that was in one, looking at the comprehensive plan that McCall's produced, which identifies annexation paths, as well as growth patterns and anticipated uh, movement in the market around and within that area of impact. So effectively what we've done is provided us a time to try and act within the plan to be able to determine what we can do with these parcels. Um, this is what we're saying as an ideal situation. By no means are we, if we don't hit within five years or am I going to get fired or something like that. This is just some sort of goal that we're trying to get, get with. Uh, in order to look at how we can maximize some of the, the parcels that we understand to be ready for transition, as opposed to going to something that's probably not going to be ready in 20 years. I mean, we could go to the tip and start looking at that, um, but it, it's probably pretty obvious what those uses are. Um, as compared to Dinehart, where you have a split, split potential use of commercial in the front and then uh, in the rear potential residential. Um, that's a completely different situation, both from access, uh, infrastructure, and many other factors um, between the two. Does that answer your question? Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, Nick Harris had a question through the chat application. 
isn't it within the mandate of the board to hold land for the purpose of appreciation? Um, because as an asset class, land is less volatile than financial assets and uncorrelated in the case of land around the McCall, potentially a higher return through appreciation. Um, I think for this one, we'll, we'll kind of split it up. Angela, if you would chime in on this, and then we'll ask uh, Chris and Tom, the manager of investments from the Endowment Fund Investment Board to address it as well. Sure. So uh, the, the obligation is to maximize long-term financial return to the endowment beneficiaries. And there's lots of ways to do that. Um, sometimes it's selling a piece of property, taking those gains and either buying timber land or putting them in the permanent fund or, you know, some other sort of transaction. Sometimes it may be holding on to lands for appreciation, although, you know, as we all know, um, part of capturing the appreciation with lands is a, it's a timing issue as well. So there's, you know, issues about, okay, maybe that land is appreciating sky high right now and probably will in the future, but, you know, at some point it may drop again. And will I be, IDL be able to time any sort of transaction correctly if it wants to do that. Um, the other thing I would note, um, and I, I'm not sure how much, uh, Jim, I think Mitch mentioned this, but you know, IDL's asset management plan and different documents call for a combination of financial resources, financial funds, the permanent funds that, that Chris will talk about, uh, balanced with land. And that provides the endowment portfolios with consistent returns and a stability that you just can't find if you're all within one type of, of asset, asset class. Um, having said that, if I say too much, get out over my skis. So I am going to pass it over to the expert who would be Chris Anton. Chris, the floor is yours. Okay, hopefully I have my, my speaker fixed at this point. Um, you know, we, we looked at this question, I guess, when when we've looked at what to do with uh, the, the money that's been generated from the cabin site sales. <clears throat> I think as many of you know, there's money in what we call the land bank, which is an account at the treasurer's office um, from, from proceeds from the cabin site sales, both around Payout Lake and Priest Lake. And we looked at what you, the land board looked at, what should they do with that money? Should they put it in the, the financial assets, which is the endowment portfolio or reinvest that money in land? And um, one of the factors was that the revenue generated from lands tends to be a more stable source of income, particularly on the timber side, um, because it generates nice cash flow. And so um, one of the things the De Department of Lands has looked at is should they reinvest that in timber because it generates nice revenue. Um, but in this case, as Bill said, timber land, we can't sell it. So the appreciation really doesn't benefit, the, doesn't really benefit the beneficiaries, doesn't help the beneficiaries in, in, in the long term. Um, but the land around McCall, I think what we're talking about, many of that is many of that land is transitioned from timber land to other uses. And so um, the, the land board could look at that and say, yeah, let's hold it for a while. We think it's going to be worth more down the road or let's lease it for a while and eventually sell it. But I think that's what this this committee is all about, is looking at that transition land and saying, what is what is the best way to go about this? Should we sell it? Should we lease it? Should we hold it for a while and eventually sell it? Um, so I, I think that's really what we're trying to get to is what should we do with this land and how should we do it both to help the beneficiaries, but do it in a responsible manner. All right. Thank you, Chris. And through the chat of clients, I saw Jonathan, you have a question. Yeah. And, um, and I, I, I want to make sure that this one is not seen as a, a, a criticism of the, the strategy that we've seen that, that Ryan and others worked on, but I, I guess a, just kind of a fundamental question. And, and, you know, I looked up the definition of strategy and uh, the definition of a strategy is a plan of action or policy designed to achieve a major goal or overall aim. And it, it seems to me, and based on some of the discussion that we've had today, that there's, you know, obviously the overall aim that we are trying to achieve is for the land board to achieve its 
fiduciary duty to maximize value. I mean, I, I would maintain that there are some other considerations there relative to the uh, navigable waters of, of Payette Lake, but, you know, setting that discussion aside, it, it seems to me that the, the strategy that was drafted and, and understanding, again, that that's just a draft, uh, it's not the final, uh, you know, proposal, but that it seems that that there isn't a broad enough consideration of how could how we could potentially achieve and how IDL and the land board could it potentially achieve that requirement to maximize financial returns over the long term while also meeting their other statutory obligations. And so I, I guess my recommendation at this point and kind of having this presentation with this group is to encourage us to think about what are different uh, approaches that we could take to achieve that. The, the strategy, it seems to me, largely to be a schedule or a timeline for potential disposal of those lands. And I don't think that's our overall aim. And, and correct me if I'm, I'm misreading that, but it seems to me that, that you know, disposal is one option, right? I mean, one option could be to dispose of all the lands and just to take all that money give it all to, to Chris and say, go forth and, and do good things with the, uh, the endowment accounts. Um, but I guess it, it seems to me that there's that to really do the strategy right, we want to step back a little bit and think about what are different pathways to achieve that that could include different alternatives other than disposal. So just kind of wanted to uh, get that out on the table. Bill, would you feel that one, please? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Scott. And Jonathan, I appreciate the question, and, and I think I, I want to clarify a little bit what these uh, what these timelines in the plan mean. And and if we say something is a tier one property, that's not direction to take it to market next year. That's direction that that's a high priority for us to analyze and figure out: can we close that gap, or is disposition the right solution? Um, there there's a in, there may be for some parcels a strong argument made for a lease and hold strategy and capture lease value and capture appreciation over time. Uh, that may work for some parcels. So um, I think I wanna be clear about that. Just because something is tier one, doesn't mean it's going on the market in 2021 or 2022. It might um, as we analyze it and as the board decides to take action. But, um, but the big thing for us is to figure out, those are high priorities for us to figure out what the best outcome for those parcels is on behalf of the beneficiaries. Thanks, if, I, if I may add to that as well, Ryan, in his presentation, I think people glom on to keywords that trigger an emotional response to him. So you hear disposition, but he also talked, we have a moratorium on leases right now up there that are not our traditional ones. Those, those are on the table too. And as you recall, we had the wedding site venue issue that came up and that's really what drove us to here that was a non-traditional lease there was things that could have been done better that's what we're trying to get at is there are other opportunities we need to know from your guys opinion what's going to be okay to discuss and ultimately the landlord is going to make the decision but that's why that's why we're all here what is what is an acceptable alternative so that's i, I guess everybody take that we're not we're not wanting to wholesale everything under the sun. That's not the pr primary alternative. So I would just remind everybody of that. Yeah, Jim, Jim or Ryan, that was kind of part of my question I was going to ask is uh, regarding Ryan's presentation, he discussed the moratorium on non-traditional leases. I guess what is the process for removing that? And then what exactly does that open it up for leases of any type of activity? I, I guess specifically what I'm asking is could conservation or recreation groups like Swimba and the Snowmobilers Association, could they enter into a lease on some of these state grounds for access or conservation purposes if that moratorium's uh, lifted? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Scott. So <clears throat> ultimately we need to get the plan through the land board and it approved in the land board to allow us and give us a direction to continue or to resume leasing in McCall. And they could do that even without a plan. And so ultimately the goal and the intention behind the moratorium was to allow us some time to provide something to the land board that was more coherent than just what we typically do. And so that's really some of the, the impetus behind the plan. 
Um, so it's that March date, March, April date that we're shooting for to hopefully get through this process and then be able to offer leasing again for those non-traditional types. Uh, when we, when your second question about once we have the moratorium lifted, what does that mean? So there's a lot of processes that are in place that we're working through. And part of that was the land board asked the department to go through and uh, revise its leasing process in April of 2019. We're still doing that to a certain degree with different leases. And so we're not complete with every single lease type that we have. With that being said, if we do have a lease template that we could use uh, for some of these activities, then yeah, we would certainly consider some proposals, whether it's Swimba or, or any other type of lease on those lands. It depends on the type of lease, however, to how we would evaluate that and how we would move forward. So for example, if you had a, a, a commercial recreation lease or some sort of recreation lease like for, uh, for mountain bike trails, um, we would certainly look at that and determine what other uses are on the ground, what's the, how many miles of trail, uh, what are some other uses, what type of encumbrance would it be. So we would have to go through some internal vetting to determine whether or not we would per proceed with it. And we do have leases, uh, as you've heard already, with, with mountain biking community um, groups. And so I think that I'm talking a lot more than probably you're, you asked, but yeah, we would start looking at leasing and we'd be going through the process. All right. Thank you, Ryan. Julie, um, we've got a question from you in the queue, but first I want to um, call on Mr. Clyde Strong. I know Clyde, you've got kind of a, a hard deadline approaching for your availability this afternoon, but you made a really excellent point in the chat apparatus. Tell us a bit more about that, please. Scott, uh, what I was pointing back to is uh, oftentimes we get just focused on the land transaction itself as opposed to looking at the broader board's uh, fiduciary duty. The board manages two different distinct parts of the trust. One part is the uh, earnings reserve fund or the permanent fund, I should say. We have a permanent fund which provides the, the monies that go to the schools on an annual basis. Then we have the land trust. And one of the things that's critical to the board's decision is not to look at each asset independently, but to look at them as a group and make a determination on how the collective set of assets have to be managed. And so as we look at the payout lands, we need to be thinking them and about them in the context of that broader duty. And uh, we oftentimes just keep going back to the phrase uh, long-term uh, return to the endowment. That's really been dealt with in the context of the overall trust management by creating an earnings reserve fund, which uh, deals with what we call the intergenerational aspect of the trust. We can't look just to the current beneficiaries, but we have to look to future beneficiaries. And so under that uh, earnings reserve fund, we, we've tried to develop or the state tried to develop a process by which we could give a steady rate of return and an increasing value over time. And so when we start thinking about the management of these lands, and I think we have to keep always in the back of our mind that in uh, that context of the larger trust and how this decision fits into that uh, diversification objective that uh, we have between those two distinct parts of the trust. Thank you, Clive. And um, I know when I was a land board staffer early in my career, it was a, an aha moment when I began to understand that the board had a duty to the current beneficiary, but the future one as well for that idea of generational equity between beneficiaries within that one class. So thank you. Um, Julie had asked, in Ryan's illustration, different ways to maximize revenues and parcel G appreciation is not part of the chart, along with lease payments. Why not use that sort of appreciation estimate or calculation to put you some revenue to parcel G rather than attributing zero to it? Bill, do you want to field that one, please? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Scott. And that's a good, good question, Julie. Thank you. Um, as we look, you know, I talked just a little bit ago about a potential lease and hold strategy. Um, and I don't know if it's proper terminology, but there may be parcels where it makes sense to lease for some amount as much as we can. And the appreciation then makes up the rest of the difference between what we, between the earnings that the beneficiaries could receive if we, for example, sold that for $10 million and sent it over to be managed along with the other financial assets getting a return of around six or six and a half percent over time. 
So if you look at a situation where you were leasing a parcel like that or some other parcel for um, 4% and continuing to hold it and gain the appreciation, yeah, that, that could be a scenario that works pretty well um, for the beneficiaries for the long term. I think it could work well. For us, though, in terms of revenue on our income statement and everything else that we do here, um, that's income return that we're talking about and, and the importance of us generating income and getting that over to the earnings reserve account. Um, that, um, that's a little different thing. Where we use appreciation is when we're calculating total return on asset that comes into play there. Um, so a little bit different thing, return on asset versus, versus income return directly to the beneficiaries today. Bill, does some of that come down to how IDL reports its finances as well? Mm -hmm. That's yes, cool. yes, Scott, it does, and and we and we do report both numbers. We report on our income statement, um, total income and total expenses, and we we typically, as an organization, net somewhere around fifty million dollars per year, forty-five to fifty million dollars per year, um, of cash income return for the beneficiaries. We also report return on asset by asset class. Um, actually, Callan Associates, who's the land board's general consultant, calculates that. Um, we report the numbers to them. They do the calculations and report to the board on what the return on asset by asset class was uh, uh, during the last year, last three years, last five years, et cetera. So we, over the last five years, put ourselves into a financial reporting structure that's very similar to what you would see in, in, in the private sector uh, timberland owners in terms of how we report to the board on our performance. Thank you. Maybe I can add one more thing uh, in terms of Julie's question regarding appreciation. And that is, so when, in, in the scenario that I presented, it was based on a different type of lease as well. So when you have timber, we're talking about uh, ground that you're looking at harvest value, where we have residential, where we're looking at revenue through leasing. And so when we are issuing residential leases, part of that lease is a reevaluation at a certain term, which is, is going to assume an appreciation through the market value. And so that's the reason why in that example, I'm using appreciation is because we're capturing the appreciation in that scenario through appraisals, which is the basis for the rent on the cottage site leases. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, Dave Bingaman had a question. Uh, what responsibility does IDL have for a leaseholder on lands that are also being managed for timber production? Specifically, if a trail or other infrastructure is established, the IDL work with the leaseholder to protect that infrastructure during future harvest. Who is the ideal contact to discuss potential lease terms with? Ryan, I think that falls into your shop. Well, why don't I take the first part of that and Ryan can have the second part. Perfect, thanks Jim. So if we're talking about timber as the primary use, remember that it is the primary use. So if you have a lease and you put infrastructure in, yep, we're gonna work with you, but the caveat you need to know from day one is that when we need to manage timber there, that is the priority. And so that happens, I can't think of an example specifically outside of grazing off the top of my head, but there are grazing fences. We will work to protect those. And we put it upon the purchaser, the timber, if they damage it, they'll fix it. In a trail situation, we would probably, because of safety, while you're doing harvesting activities, we would, we would have to have terms in our lease that would tell you when we're harvesting, you can't use that portion of your lease because we're, you know, we're doing timber harvesting activities and we don't want people riding through there. And, and you've heard, I've heard horror stories about that, even like when they're down on the, with Tamarack going in, you know, you got people out when before it was an official thing, downhill skiing, and they're going through the middle of a logging unit or something. And, you know, we can't stop all that stuff from happening, but that's our intent is that when we're doing our timber management, we don't want other activities for public safety and logger safety and all that, th those kinds of things to, to take place. But we will protect your infrastructure to the best of our ability. And Jim, I can answer a little bit on the trail side because it's something we deal with on a lot of our timber sales here. And like Jim said, the primary use is the, we're talking about a million dollar timber sale versus a lease that gets $2,000 a year. You can see where that priority lies. But what we do is we really do work with the loggers because um, generally the local loggers don't want to mess up that infrastructure either. A lot of them use it. So 
We'll ask them to follow the trees away from the trails, keep the slash cleaned up when they have equipment near it. It's never going to be perfect, but we've done a pretty good job with existing uh, trails where we get right in the most complexes where we have the unpermitted trails. Um, we do not make any provisions for them to protect those at all. Um, if they're not under a permit or a lease with IDL. So that's just something to keep in mind. Like the Simba Trail is um, under a land use permit. That will be discussed. We have an upcoming Goose Bay timber sale that's already been discussed um, with the forester. He's aware of it. He'll be working in his pre-work meetings with the operators to make sure that they're aware of it's there. Um, the traffic that's going to bring into the timber sale area for safety reasons, as well as the slash management. Skid trails, we'll, we'll have as long as it doesn't, we don't have to build an allowance into the sale that costs more than what we're making on the secondary use. Uh, we, we go quite a ways to protect that infrastructure um, because there's also a responsibility on the trail builders to keep drainages in place and not have water delivery to live streams. So th that's all taken into consideration, but we, we've gotten a pretty good system down here around the lake that we, we work together pretty well. Scott, David, I think you might have a question too. We, we still need to hit the second part oh, of. Sorry about that. Yeah, so so I would suggest that if you have a question regarding to a certain type of lease that you look on the website under leasing to see which program manager that would be appropriate for, um, you can always contact me and then I could work with the specific program manager or Scott. So it really depends on what the question is regarding which program. We have minerals, oil and gas, geothermal, alternative energy, commercial, recreation, grazing, farming, uh, there's a lot of different leases, so it, each program manager um, manages a different type of activity. David, you got a question, then we'll get to Nick. Okay, yeah, uh, this is a sort of a bigger picture question about uh, the, the lake uh, in the context of the trust lands. So how does the department currently view the tension between trust protection of the waters of Big Pay Lake with its trust lands mandate and maybe stated a different way, how could disposition or return on assets be affected by approximate responsibility to protect Big Pay at Lake? Where does that balance lie? Who on the team, Bill? Well, and, and I'm gonna, um... I'm going to deflect a little bit because it, I don't know if anyone noticed, but Angela did step out. And, and so to the extent that that there's a legal aspect to that question, um, I, I'm not an attorney and I, I, I prefer not to try to do that. Um, uh, you know, we we can we have a, a constitutional mandate to maximize long term revenue to the beneficiaries. Now, we also look we have a stewardship responsibility as well. Right. When we're managing our lands and. And the, the idea, if we're doing forest management on lands uh, in proximity, whether that's to a stream or a lake, uh, we, we have uh, uh, the Forest Practices Act and best management practices that we put in place to protect those, those things. Um, so in terms of our management, um, we feel pretty good about our ability to protect water quality as we're doing that type of work. And it would be hard for me to, to comment on, on the potential um, of any, you know, what may happen on a parcel in the future, um, uh, strictly hypothetical is a little tough, tough to deal with um, in terms of responding to that question accurately. So um, as, the, as you described the tension, that, that gets to be a little bit more of a legal question. And I, I'd like to, if I can, stay away from that, but that's something we could ask Angela to address for the group. Sure. Okay, thank you. Real quick, Bill, I might add that we also have the, um, we administer the Lake Protection Acts that when you know, you do have an owner of property adjacent to the lake, um, they would inherently have, if they are, have fee title ownership of that ground, they would have their littoral rights. So if they want to uh, place a dock or some sort of infrastructure out there that is consistent with the parameters within the Lake Protection Act, then we would analyze that um, and, uh, and, and see if, if that is infrastructure that can be um, uh, placed you know, adjacent to that property. So I, I don't know if you're kind of linking the two there, but, you know, as Bill said, we do have uh, the Forest Practices Act and standards that we do meet on our on our timberlands and the uplands to uh, to manage uh, 
uh, water quality uh, and uh, fish bearing streams, and then also the Lake Protection Act for when there is development around the lake. Thanks, Dustin. All right, um, Nick, I think you had a question next. Yeah, thank you, Scott. Um, hopefully you can see me now, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so I did want to point out there's been a lot of focus on uh, income return and the underperformance of the McCall parcel. And I, and I did want to point out just, you know, having a bit of a finance economics background that, you know, there is there are situations where the pursuit or the over pursuit of income return actually undermines long term economic value. Right. And that's really the the focus of the board is to achieve long-term economic return for the beneficiaries. And just if you look back at that graphic or think back in your head of the lands that are in question, it's literally half of the Lake of McCall or darn near it, right? And the surrounding areas that the, the IDL controls. And, I, and if you think back to your college economics class and you remember the concept of monopoly, right? Um, the IDL does have almost a monopoly on the land that's surrounding the lake. That's, that's a reality. Right. And so, um, you know, if you think back to monopoly returns and why it is that government doesn't like them, it's because monopolies control the supply and therefore the, the price. And people are moving to Idaho in droves and McCall has a tremendous scarcity value. So, you know, I, I would I would make a point that, you know, by controlling over a long, long extended period of time and not trying to pursue this in this concept of income return or being reasonable about it. Um, is actually the best use and the best long-term return for the IDL and for the state. Thanks, Nick. Uh, Julie Manning had a question via chat. If a revenue gap is closed with respect to a parcel, does that end the problem? I'd say Bill, Ryan, or Jim, any of you wish to wade in? Yeah, I mean, um, Sure. <laughs> um, you know, Ryan described it earlier, the revenue gap is one of the drivers of this process uh, that, that's causing us to take a hard look at, at the lands up there. And, and certainly if we were, and I mentioned it earlier in terms of what I call the lease and hold strategy, there may be a better name for that. But if there were a situation where, where, where the land board could continue to hold those lands and uh, achieve uh, the necessary returns and close that gap. Certainly, that that could change the the whole uh, analysis of, of what to do with that parcel moving forward. Thanks, Bill. Uh, Diane had a request for materials for our next meeting. Um, we'll capture that and we'll make sure we can accommodate that request. Um, Jonathan had asked, uh, "What if the returns from leases would exceed returns from timber harvest over the long term?" Timberland classification would still take precedence or maximum return would take precedence. Say a bill or Jim. And, and I would also apply that, you know, think one of the things that I think is important to think about in the context of the discussion and the focus group is that we're looking at this issue through the lens of McCall, but there are implications for this approach to be applied statewide. I mean, that's one of the things that we heard the land board say is that this is kind of a test case that has potential precedent setting implications for the rest of the state. And so while some people might see that question that I posed and say, well, it's not very likely that that, uh, you know, a small scale trail is going to uh, exceed the returns from timber harvest. But I would argue that it they very well might on some rangeland returns that only have that, I think, 0.3% hurdle rate. And so thinking about this around McCall is is one thing. But thinking about how it applies more broadly, I think is an important component as this focus group is chewing on some of these issues. Thank you. Um, Kristen Sinclair had a question. Going back to stewardship. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I thought Bill was going to answer that question. Though, right? I saw his I saw his microphone get off, uh, come off, and I don't want to I don't want him to get off that easily. Can I get off that easily if I just click it back on? Click the oh, okay. Um so you know I, I, that's a really interesting topic, Jonathan. I mean, um, and uh, you know it, it would depend on the the use. I mean, there are situations where, for example, a, you may take a, a, a portion of an acre and, and put a com site on. And I'm not I'm not planning on any com sites next to the lake. I know we don't have any proposals like that right now. But 
but there could be a scenario on timberland where taking that portion of timberland out of production for timber and putting it into a communication site would produce more revenue over the long term than timber management would. And, and so it would depend on what it is and where it is as we do that analysis and, and, and figure out what's, what's best for the long term for the beneficiaries. A lot, a lot of uh, hypotheticals and unknowns there, but, but, it, but it's a really interesting topic and something we have to, to look at as we go forward. All right, it's about 3.57. I've got one more question in the queue. This is Christian Sinclair. Going back to stewardship, which is listed as a value in the plan, is that only in reference to the timberland forest management or does it extend across all departments and functions? Um, Dustin, stewardship of the agency, what does it mean? Yeah, thanks, Scott. And, and Kristen, yeah, I appreciate that. And like I said in, in my remarks earlier, um, you know, stewardship is a, is a big part of, of, of what we do and who we are. Um, we've got to take care of the land to ensure that over time uh, we can generate the revenue through the management of natural resources and again, maximize that revenue. So um, there are various statutes that uh, we adhere to that we're required to adhere to. Like I mentioned, the uh, uh, the Lake and River Protection Act, the Forest Practices Act, um, uh, various binding statutes, all of that to ensure that we are um, managing the resource in a, in a way, a uh, sustainable way to ensure its productivity over the long term. Um, so that's certainly in, in our best interest to, uh, to continue to do that across uh, all, of our, all of our programs. And um, there's other things that we're doing you know, outside of our endowment programs through uh, uh, regulatory and assistance and forestry assistance, uh, even with the federal government with GNA and shared stewardship uh, to uh, utilize our expertise and our backgrounds to help uh, improve conditions uh, on national forest system lands. Uh, that, and that also includes uh, hauling volume, additional uh, timber volume off national forest system lands. Uh, which is which is uh, beneficial to the logging industry, but two, uh, utilizing a lot of those funds to go back onto the landscape to improve the condition of national forests, in particular those areas that are adjacent to endowment land. So uh, stewardship across of all of our endowment programs, uh, in addition to the work we're doing with the federal government, it's a big part of who we are and what we do. All right. Thanks, Dustin. Appreciate that. Tammy, I'm going to put you in the hot seat for just a moment. Could you please pull up and share the draft agenda for our meeting on the 11th? All right, I'm glad to see that I haven't been fired as moderator for our next meeting. That's good news, right, everyone? All right, so uh, kind of, I guess, next steps. We, again, we covered a tremendous amount of ground today. and. Um, as we wrap up, are there any other just pressing questions that we got to have today, or do you want to mull it over and come back with more questions next time? So, Scott, I would like to just add that um, we'll send out the agenda to all of the members uh, within the next couple of days, no later than Monday. And if there's any other additional documents to read as part of that. So just to note that everybody doesn't have to start writing this down, that they'll receive it in an email within the next day or two. Thank you. And then we'll also um, endeavor to get that out to the public via uh, our website, social media, and probably a media advisory as we did for this, this round as well. I know there's a lot of, uh, a lot of folks in the community that are interested in this. In fact, today at the high point, I noted that we had 83 folks between the panelists and then the attendees watching today's meeting. So we really appreciate everyone's interest and the time they took to tune in. Um, so moving forward, as Ryan mentioned, you'll receive notifications of the meetings coming up. And Jonathan, I saw that you had a chat come across. Let me look at that. We've got to hop off for another meeting. Again, Jonathan, thanks for joining us and uh, see that you got to go. Um, <clears throat> so next steps, we'll have the agenda out for you and just think about your questions. Uh, Angela covered a lot of ground with the legal framework that the board must operate under. I just want to reiterate that that is available on the IDL website under about understanding endowment land. Within that section, you'll find kind of the, the high points, the cliff notes of the constitutional obligation under um, Article 9, Section 8, along with the admissions bill and information about uh, the uh, exclusions of public trust doctrine to uh, Idaho endowment lands that are embedded in Title 58 of Idaho Code. So there's some, some good information if you need a refresher as you're thinking about things. Um, 
appreciate everyone's attention today. It's four o'clock. I think we're, we're right on schedule, which is great. And uh, we will be in touch and we'll see you all on the 11th. So thank you very much. Thanks, everybody.